talk about impact. <sighs> this show. Seriously, this was like this was the go home show to the latest biggest show of all time. How many biggest shows of all time has Impact had? I they seem to have care. one like every month now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's I like just, yeah. January fourth was the biggest show of all time. And, and the then, one show they did on Monday was the biggest show of all time. It was January fourth. January fourth no. was the biggest show of all time. And then the next pay per view was like the biggest TNA pay per view of all time. And then now we've got the new biggest show of all time. How many all biggest shows of all time can you have? And it would be different, by the way, if the ratings and numbers were going up, and each one was, in fact, bigger than the last, because then it would at least be true. Let me actually read the, for those of you that haven't seen the ratings yet, uh, for those of you that just read the, uh, you just read the daily update today. Or, sim- well, yeah, or simply avoided all news about this show altogether, which would be even better. Yeah, let's look at the, the ratings here. It pulled a uh, 1.14, 0.9 in males 18 to 49, a 0.6 in persons 18 to 49, a 0.7 in the coveted male 18 to 34 demographic. Raw's in like the twos. Average of 1.5 million viewers. And by the way, of course, last week, Bischoff went on and on about how it's the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Never mind the fact that Raw went up against the Olympics and did a great number. But it, of course, affected impact. Well, this week, I guess it's it's the Jay Leno show. What would it have been this week? Because there are no Olympics on. I know um, that. Apparently, without people flipping channels during the Olympics, all televisions were just turned off. The show opened at a 1.3. So people tuned in and cared. And actually, that doesn't surprise me. Because what was the angle to end last week's show? The heels bloodied up. Hulk Hogan and left him laying. So, and then of course, actually Hogan made his challenge afterwards. Yes. For, so I guess maybe people tuned in this week to see the follow-up to that. Because it opened at 1.3. Good number. Fell to 1.25. Held steady for another 1.25. Fell to a 1.22. Fell to a 1.15. Fell to a 1.04. <laughs> fell to an 0.94. Fell to an 0.93. An 0.93. And, he, he, and each segment was worse than the one before it? Yeah. yeah. There was that one segment that grew from the segment before. That every, is impact in a nutshell right there. Every single segment fell. 0.93. The final segment before you move to Monday nights. A 0.93. I've been talking for years. For literally years about how they've got to get rid of Vince Russo. For years now. I guess they just don't care. No, apparently not. <laughs> Perhaps, as I said before, they just hate money. I mean, I realize that Dixie Carter is... is uh, she doesn't know anything about wrestling. That is clear. I mean, if you read the if you read the congressional testimony, I mean, she's clearly clueless. She's learned everything from Vince Russo. <laughs> That's terrifying. And all these other dumb shits from WCW that became a part of, of TNA. She learned wrestling from all the losers. You know what I mean? Yeah. WCW died, and all the failures ended up in TNA, and they taught Dixie Carter wrestling. Okay? But even then, you'd think that if you looked at your own business, and you looked, you just looked at how bad the TV was, I mean, we've been ranting about how shitty this TV has been for years now. You'd think if you just looked at that, eventually you'd see the light. You'd go, huh, you know... We're back to a 1.14. We brought in a Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair. We've got Mick Foley here, Kevin Nash, all these stars. Back down to 1.14. Huh. Wonder why that is. What could it possibly be? Yet, apparently she does not. Still fucking employing Vince Russo. Let's look at this show. This was such a god-awful television program. Like, I don't know. How can you write a show this bad? <laughs> As the go home show to Monday night. I think there was one segment on the show, one segment on the entire show that I actually liked. Which one? The the Jarrett Tonko match. Oh, the match. So you're talking the about the match. one in the bathroom. No, no, no. And not Tonko's physical appearance either. So just the match itself. Impact opened, and of course, based on the rating patterns, all downhill from there. That's astounding, first off. Flair and AJ come out flanked by women, still playing AJ's old babyface music. There's like a mistake in every single segment on this show. Just I'm like sure the old there days. will be. I'm certain there will be. Just like the old days. 
So Flair cut a promo saying they'd had a week to think about what happened with the Hulkster. They knew he was in the building. They wanted him to come out right now so they could give him a present. So Hogan and Abyss come out, and Flair says he wants this to be a peaceful confrontation. Now, first off, why Hulk Hogan didn't come out and just beat the fuck out of him, I have absolutely no idea. You know what I mean? I, uh, yeah. They beat him up, they bloodied him up, they humiliated him at the end of last week's show. And so a week later, he comes out and he just gets in the ring to hear them out. You're, you're not wrong, but we see that in wrestling a lot these days. So, In what other segments? All on Impact? I'm sure there are segments in WWE where guys have come to, have been, the show has ended with them in physical violence and they've come out getting a promo on the next show. Beaten bloody? They don't, don't do blood very often. I mean, it, it, I mean, think about this though. Hulk Hogan was so mad last week that he vowed to return to the ring. Yeah. It's gotta be pretty mad. <laughs> in fact, on this entire show, he's ranting and raving and bitching about how he got punked out and he's got to do this for his own for his own no. self-esteem. He Maybe he knew no one was going to watch this show, so he wanted to save it for that one. So he comes out, and he's so mad that he just stands there to hear Flair out. Yes. And Flair says, I'm sorry I beat you up, and to, to pay you back, you can fuck either one or all four of these girls. Hogan says, I don't want any of them. He said when he came here, he promised Dixie Carter and his family that he wouldn't climb into the ring and lace up the boots. He promised to take TNA to the top, but after what Rick and his wannabe flair did to him last week, everything has changed. He said in four days, he and Abyss were going to take Rick and AJ to school. Again, he's so mad that he has no problem waiting 12 days to get his revenge. So, he says, what you going to do, and... Abyss finishes it when Abyssomania runs wild on you. Abyssomania, everybody. <laughs> this was so lame. So, Flair said two years ago he did the same thing. He retired in front of the whole world. Retired on the highest stage possible. Which, of course, is WrestleMania. That is true. Which is way higher than anything in TNA, of course. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> and he said he was looking forward to killing Hogan more than anything he'd ever done. Because the one thing he'd never accomplished was beating Hogan on national television and hurting him. And... AJ cut a promo and said, "When Hogan, when you wrestled, I, you were the king, but times have changed. Now I'm the king. And anyway, Flair's goading him on, and then he says, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> it was very strange. Out of nowhere. Yeah. No it, no culmination, no, no climax of the speech. It's like, oh, AJ, let's go. In, in fact, AJ said, Hulk, I'm going to give you a chance to back out rather than wrestle me and get embarrassed on national television. And then Flair cut him off. Yeah. Before he didn't get a response. And then Bischoff came out. And Bischoff comes out. And he says that AJ had some business to take care of tonight, and Flair was not going to take him out of the building. He was going to be defending the title in a four corners match against Abyss, Desmond Wolf, and the Pope. That's right. It's AJ Styles versus the Pope at the next pay per view. But for absolutely no reason, they put AJ and the Pope yes. in a four way. Yeah. On impact, yes. with no build. <laughs> this is astounding. I forget, forget for a second the fact that Pope is in there. AJ Styles defending the title against three opponents with no build. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Does Eric hate AJ? I guess. I, if, there's a lot of hate to go around, I suppose. If I had him, if I had built this show around having Eric hate Jarrett, I would be satisfied with having him hate one person. But no, he has to hate AJ as well. Stupid. It's very, very stupid. It, 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 the title is cheap. I don't meant anything anyway. And and they're, they're and they're having AJ wrestle the Pope for the title a few weeks before AJ wrestles Pope for the title. Yeah. And Pope would address this later. Not a non-title match. Not a tag match. Not a tag no. match. A four a four-way match for the title. Yeah. For no reason. Desmond did an interview with a generic girl, and she's actually more generic than the four generic girls that Flair came out with. And he did a promo. There was some rhyming cockney in there, which was the only thing that saved this. And anyway, after he called Abyss a window licker, his woman spoke up and she said, Des, that ring Abyss is wearing, it's beautiful, and I want it. I think we should both have some gold tonight, and you can make it happen, can't you? And he said, of course, because what Chelsea wanted, Chelsea got. So apparently that's her name. And that's apparently now his gimmick. He's 
He's Chelsea's whipped man. Those weird ass Japanese robots have more charisma than this girl. <laughs> she, she, I will concede she did not make a great impression on me. You can't find a girl that I, can I, talk. Apparently not. Apparently in, in all Florida. of Orlando, Florida. I guess that's they what couldn't they, find a single actress with an a inkling of charisma. Now you know why they had to open the LA office to get a girl who can talk. Well, even then they didn't do anything. Well. So the L.A. office discovered Chelsea. Apparently. They got bigger problems than I than I anticipated. We had more with Bischoff. He made an XFL joke here in 2010. I, I first off, again, it's not it's not the mid 90s anymore. It was one thing when WCW was beating WWF and Bischoff was making fun of them. Okay, when WWE is gonna do a million buys at WrestleMania. And you're getting a point nine three with a Hogan Flair segment. Who the fuck are you to be making fun of anybody? Right. Barry the XFL. So, which actually I think was probably a less spectacular failure than Bischoff's destruction of WCW. To be quite honest with you, uh, far much? more people lost their jobs. <laughs> There's that, and uh, the the XFL really never made money. They just lost a lot. WCW made a ton of money and then lost it all in just a few years. So you may have a good point. So anyway, Jeff Jarrett came in. They talked for like a minute, and I was staring at the screen, and a minute in, I suddenly realized I had no earthly idea what they had been discussing. No. And moreover, I did not care enough to go rewind and go back and check. But they talked for a lot more. But they, what they said was, Jarrett said that Bischoff could set goons upon him, he could make him flip burgers. It doesn't matter. He was here in TNA and he was not lo- leaving. So Eric told him to go clean the latrines. Yeah. And so Jarrett took the plunger and said he was going to be the best janitor of all time. All right. So this took like five what minutes. What a rebel, by the way. <laughs> Give me that plunger. <laughs> this, I'm going to do it. This took like five minutes. All I could think was to think people turned off the show. People do not want to see Jarrett and Bischoff discuss plumbing for five minutes at a time. Motor C Machine Guns versus Generation Me versus Beer Money versus Matt Morgan and Hernandez. Because what this show needed was two random four ways. Again, Beer Money is facing Matt Morgan and Hernandez for the titles at the pay-per-view. So I have no idea why they're in this four-way here on Impact. So the Guns and the Bucks did some high spots. Hernandez tagged in, threw him around. Morgan blind tagged in. Hernandez was unhappy, as were you the other day. They stole our spot. And the fans still chanted for Morgan, which was the best part. Morgan's pissed off and acting heelish, and the fans chant his name. Because these people have no idea what they're doing. And I'm not talking about the fans. So he double choke slams well, both they also bucks, have no idea, but... making them look like complete geeks. Starts yelling at Hernandez, and Rude rolls him up for the pin. They did, in fact, steal our finish, which we stole from Shawn Michaels and Triple H. <laughs> I might add. There is a chain of, of stealing going on. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was eight men doing a match in four minutes. There was a lot of stuff happening, and if you care, I guess you're a better man than I. You know, when I was thinking of the finish for our match in Tulalip, I, I had this idea in my head. I had this vision of the finish of this match and how we were going to set up this incredible partners deal. And and I was watching Raw like a few days after I'd come up with this idea. And they showed the replay of the DX match. Yes, you, you didn't. And the hit. exact same finish. And I just looked at it and went, huh? <laughs> That's where you got it. I got it. I stole it from them. And I didn't even remember it you, at the time. You, you, without even meaning to, you stole it from them. I blatantly, blatantly stole it from them. And I might add they did it much better. I bet that's true. Then we had the... We had Bischoff meeting with Morley and told him that he'd forgotten to tell Jeff this, but he was signing him to a no-DQ false count anywhere match tonight with Val Venus. He told him he'd find him in the men's room. He told him to go get the job done. So... This took them also like a minute to do. All I could think was, are they building towards Eric Bischoff versus Jeff Jarrett? Because Eric Bischoff has been in four segments so far, and we're 30 minutes into the show. And two of them involve Jeff, yes. I never seem to see Eric Bischoff again as long as I live. Well, it sucks to be you. Angle met with Hogan, and his office is basically Bischoff's office, where they move the furniture a little bit, and they pretend it's different offices. And he told Hogan... I didn't even realize it was supposed to be a different room. I think it is. I assume it was supposed to be Eric's office when Eric is not there. And they just walk in and out? Yeah, they just take exchange turns. places. And they tag out. He told Hogan to let him take care of AJ on Monday, and Hogan said, no, this was his deal. And Angle said, listen, you've done a great job since coming to TNA, which, by the way, based on the ratings pattern, is a lie. 
And he said, you're too important to go out there. You do your job back here. I'll go out there and do mine. Hogan said, listen, I appreciate that, but this is my last shot. I've got to go get respect for myself. This is the final straw. And I'm just thinking, why is this the last straw? I don't know. You don't, you don't think that guys are going to disrespect you on a monthly basis in TNA? <laughs> are you going to have to come out of retirement every time somebody punks you out on television, and as he claimed? If this is, if you don't wrestle Monday, you can't ever wrestle again? This is the last time you can do it? No idea what's going on. Yeah. We could repeat this piece about six times during the show. We had a segment of Foley going to etiquette school. All I'm going to say is that it was very horrible. This was the first of like a half dozen horrendous, horrendous segments. I mean, this was, you know, this was, this was worse than the skits on Wrestlelicious. Yes. Because on Wrestlelicious, they wrote the most horrendous comedy possible. Yeah. They knew it was terrible, yes. and they put in a laugh track, yes. which actually kind of made it funny, because sure. it was so bad. I, I would much rather watch the rest of Alyssa skits than watch this Mick Foley etiquette crap. Because, number one, somebody wrote all of this Mick Foley stuff, and they actually thought it was funny. Yes. It was actually designed to make us laugh. Not a single bit of it was funny. And worse, they have managed to turn Mick fucking Foley into a complete... Dork. Yeah. Like a complete <laughs> geek. It, it, Remember yeah. Mick Foley and Randy Orton's feud a couple of years ago, how awesome that was? I do. How fantastic that was? Look at what Mick Foley has become. And, and on the one hand, Mick Foley in the real world is, in fact, a complete geek, but he's also, he does a great job of playing a terrifying madman. And you're going with the complete buffoon mode. Didn't Foley rant and rave in his book about those amnesia segments? He did. Because I'll bet those were a hundred times better than this shit. Maybe we should look them up. Maybe I'm going to have to watch them again and find out if they were actually worse than this, because I can't fathom them being so. So, yeah, there were like three of these, or more. They were all horrible. We're not reviewing them anymore. Morley was backstage, told the ref to ring the bell. The ref went, ding, ding. Morley stormed into the men's room. A brawl erupted. This was so stupid, because Jeff Jarrett has no idea what's going on. Jeff Jarrett's in there with a mop, cleaning the floor. He has no idea why this man's attacking him. Mm Mm-hmm. Morley hits him with a move and makes a cover on the floor of the bathroom. Yes. And Jeff Jarrett kicks out. Right. On two. <laughs> because if I am ever jumped in the bathroom and laid out and they cover me, I'm going. I'm not going to you know, protect my head or my vital organs. No, I'm going to kick out. Tanae said it's his instincts kicking yes. in. And this is the, uh, to make it even better, a minute later... Venus just jackknife cradled him and pinned him. No, it's good. We got before we get there. Morley slammed his shoulder. He slammed a door on his shoulder repeatedly. But I can't even explain the position that Jeff Jarrett was in for this to occur. It was like it was taking him an enormous amount of effort to stay in this position. Yes. To have the door yes. slammed yes. on him five times. Yes. Val opened the door and said, Jeff, please hug this door jam here. Yeah, everybody, everybody stand up and put your arms straight out in front of you and then squat down, like yeah. halfway down like you're doing a squat, and, and stick yourself in a doorway. Yes. And first off, the, the, the balance that it would take. You'd have to be holding on to something to not fall on your ass. Well, Jared somehow apparently was. He, well, because he, was, he stood in this position, and I'm thinking, how in the fuck is he, is he holding himself up like this? He was, in fact, holding the door jam because there were twice when the door hit him, and at the exact same time, a light would go on and off. Which means on the other side of that door jam, Jeff's hand was hugging the wall and accidentally flipping a light switch. And they did not refilm this. No. So, a minute after kicking out on the floor, Jeff Jarrett is pinned to the floor. And here's what Sean Morley did after throwing him into a wall and, and slamming his shoulder on a door. Sean Morley, who is wearing traditional wrestling gear of boots, knee pads, and very small trunks, he lays Jeff Jarrett out on the floor of the men's room. Cradles his legs around, just legs around his head, and folds him up like he's fucking him. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> and then he runs off. And then he ran away. Because and that was the last he would ever be seen in TNA. What else would a rapist do? I don't know. Run off afterwards. And Bishop, by the way, told him to finish the job. And five minutes later, of course, Jared's just being massaged because <laughs> shoulders hurts everybody. I guess if you pin him, it's finishing the job. Christy interviewed Pope about how Flair and AJ severely injured his ankle two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. His ankle. 
so severely that he's wrestling tonight, yes. by the way. It, it, so Vince was right. Brett can heal by WrestleMania. Pope can heal in two weeks. Well, Pope admitted here that you know he was in the building, even though his own doctor said not to. Mm-hmm. So he suffered an ankle injury. He was not healed. And Bischoff and Hogan apparently took it upon themselves to sign him to a four-way title match at about 40%. Rob Terry pinned Doug Williams in about a minute. No idea why people were turning off the show at this point. <laughs> and then Brutus Magnus hit the ring, stomped a mud hole in in uh, in what's his face, and then uh, Brutus hit him with a hard kick to the face. Which they, it was actually he, he fucking kicked him so hard, yeah. but they didn't bother to show a replay. Of course not. Of course not. I screamed, "Ow!" No but, replay. No replay. So Jarrett's getting massaged backstage. Eric shows up, and they get to yelling at each other again. Mm-hmm. Jeff is freaking out. He's kicking shit around. He's acting like a child, not getting his way. He's supposed to be a baby face. And Eric says, if you want a match in the ring, I'll give it to you tonight. I hope you're a fast healer because it's later on. And then Jarrett called him a prick. <laughs> he said, in the unquestioned highlight of the show, you prick. Yeah. Which is what I was thinking. Shitty Foley segment. We had Ken Anderson coming out with a bald cap, a singlet, a medal, and a cookie sheet around his neck, which read, Loser. Okay, I've, I've, before we get into this skit itself, I have two things to say. One, this would have been a lot more effective if he had not shown him walking around in this getup right before the segment. And identified him. And I said, there's Ken Anderson dressed as Kurt Angle. It was funny because he was in shadow. He's more So I, I think they wanted you to think it was Kurt. But then the announcer was like, what's Ken Anderson doing in this getup? Idiots. So, that's number one. Number two, there was a debate on the board about whether it was, and elsewhere, I guess, about whether or not it was silly for Ken Anderson to be knocked unconscious with a chair shot to the back. And I was pointing out, it's not like he was incapacitated. He was not writhing in pain. No, he was unconscious for several minutes. And when they re-aired the chair shot on this clip, it was even sillier, because Angle hits him with a chair, and Anderson, like, grabs his back, and then slowly wolves to the ground and then passes out. Yeah. He sold this chair shot like he was choked into unconsciousness. Yeah. The chair shot moved over his body like he slow waved. It cut off the blood to his brain yes. when he was hit in the back. Yes. So he comes out and he's mocking Kurt for being the most injury prone wrestler in the world today. That was that fucking was hilarious. Awesome. Now I also want to mention that I don't I don't want to make fun of anyone's physique, especially a guy who's lied about steroids numerous times, but Man, when people talk about Angle looking sickly, Jesus Christ, you should have seen Mr. Anderson in this singlet. He looks horrendous. It's he not, looked horrendous. He does not look like Kurt. He made Kurt Angle, at his when he was like 200 pounds doing that movie, he made him look like Brock Lesnar in that singlet. He was so frail looking. So he comes out there, he does a stupid promo, makes a bunch of broken neck jokes, goes on and on and on and on. Angle storms out, they have a brawl. Anderson cuts him off with beer to the face and then hits him with his own Olympic slam. Nearly dropping him on his own neck in the process, by the way. You know the thing that that, uh, just, uh, maybe it's just me, but Ken Anderson lays him out with his own move, and then his his ankle is laying there unconscious, just laying flat on his back with his hands by his side. Anderson takes off his skull cap, he pulls it back because it's made of rubber, and he snaps it right he into Kurt Angle's face. He shot at him, yes. Do you know what I would have done if I were Kurt Angle in that situation? Gotten up and killed him? I would have jumped up and beat the ever-loving holy fuck out of that motherfucker. I, you're laying there with your eyes closed, having been laid out with a move, and some motherfucker decides to go into business and snap that thing into his face. I guarantee I, I, that that was, that was a... a uh, that was a deal by Anderson that he just thought up at the spur of the moment. I'm sure it was. My I, God, I would have killed that if fucker. You went, well, if, 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 because if you're seeing that because you think it hurt Kurt Angle, if you went back and watched, it was not rubber. It was some, it was like nylon. It doesn't matter. It, now it did. It, it did do. They did the you know the the heavy bit of of uh, Anderson laying Angle out with his own move and and stealing the dog tag again, and then there's this little random, random comedy bit in there. But you know what? I laughed. And on this show, I will take my amusement where I can get it. So so they've gone from that first week yeah. where Angle was in the ring crying mm-hmm. and Anderson was a great heel just being an asshole. In two episodes. In two episodes, now it's comedy. And now you're I, laughing at and it. And I am taking, the, like I say, I'm taking whatever good I can get out of it. This was wretched. 
Like, ungodly wretched. Which was the entire show, actually. And then I, I hit pause to after the segment, and I came back and realized the show was only an hour old. Yes. Oh, my God. I was out. I, right. How long have we been talking? We've been talking for almost a half hour about the show. There is more. Abyss met with Hogan, talked about how he was a little boy. His mother wouldn't let him watch TV, but he snuck upstairs to watch Hulk on the black and white TV. Is Abyss 50 years old? I was going to say, was he born in 1960? I, I have seen a black and white television in my life. Not often. So he talks about how he was such a huge fan of Hulk, and Hulk now gave him this ring. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, he was yet another baby face who does not want Hulk Hogan to get in the ring. And Hogan, of course, talked him into it, saying, he gave him this big whole thing about how, you know, you're my partner, I'm relying on you to protect me, I can barely move, but you're going to make sure I'm okay. And I'm just sitting here thinking, how in the fuck is this supposed to build up this match? Well, I don't know. Unless the, the tease is going to be... Tune in Monday to watch Impact and see Hulk Hogan be crippled. Yeah. That's what they were saying. That's how we're building this up. Hulk Hogan is so old. <laughs> so fragile. And he's so frail. And he's risking his life getting in the ring with... with uh, uh, Seriously. That, yeah, I know. You're this not watching this. This is the hook to see this match. <laughs> you're, that's not sarcasm, everyone. That is, the, that is the selling point. Hulk Hogan may die in front of you. Showed clips. This was also just classic Impact stupidity. They show clips from earlier to de- uh, earlier that day of Lacey and Madison attacking Angelina during a photo shoot. And they hold her as Velvet whips her with a pink belt. And she whipped her and whipped her and whipped her. And finally the other heels were like, Velvet, that's enough. And Velvet freaks out and says, no, I'll say when it's enough. And she whipped her more. And Angelina is laying there weeping. And so they immediately cut the commercial and come back. And Velvet is storming down to the ring. Or, sorry, Angelina. Angelina is storming down to the ring. Because, you see, the attack happened earlier in the day, and Angelina was so angry that she waited until after they showed a video recap to storm down to the ring. Maybe she forgot and was reminded when she saw the video recap. (laughs) So fucking stupid. So she calls Velvet down to the ring. I mean, hold on. Okay. Couldn't she storm down, and as she's coming to the ring, they said, oh, by the way, earlier in the day this happened. No. No. They be showed what happened earlier in the day to set up her getting so angry she stormed out. Yeah. Goddamn idiot. <laughs> so she comes out, she calls out Velvet, Angelina beats her up for a while. I kept thinking, where the hell are the other beautiful people? They finally ran down. Angelina had the belt. She's standing in the middle of the ring with her back to the ramp. Madison runs down to the ramp, climbs into the ring, walks up behind Angelina, and just stops. Yes, time freezes. I'd like to think that at some point in here, Madison said, hit me. And at that point, Angelina turned around and whipped her. This was bad. So they cut her off, and they held her down, and Velvet whipped her again. Yeah. Which means not only did they show the first whipping just to set up uh, Angelina coming down to the ring, but they showed the first whipping to set up another whipping. In this one was, in one five-minute segment, they showed the heels beating up Angelina... Angelina getting her revenge on all three of them, and then the heels beating her up again. Yes. By the end of this, I never wanted to see any of them ever again. It was just, an, uh, uh, which is astounding given what Velvet was wearing. <laughs> it is an amazing, amazing achievement to make something totally redundant in its own segment. There was a commercial break in here, and in that commercial break, what do we see? AJ Styles, heel world champion, telling us to buy a baseball video game. Mm-hmm. That will sell zero video games. We had Bubba the Love Sponge. I can't believe how much shit happened on this show. Bubba the Love Sponge comes up. And my, my line here says, some other fuck tells Hulk not to wrestle. <laughs> actually, let me tell you this. Bubba the Love Sponge actually cut a that, really good promo. I totally agree, frankly. But the problem was, the promo was so goddamn stupid. Yes. His, Bubba's delivery, A+. plus. Promo material, F. It was, again, him talking... He was he was shooting with Terry this time. He called him Terry. He he said you're you're my son, the, the godfather of my son. Hulk said he had nothing left, and Bubba said you have Nick, you have uh, uh, Brooke, you have Jennifer, you have me. I mean, it was like Vince Russo wrote this promo for like you know, but I mean the point was 
Bubba was the most passionate person on this entire show. Yes. But what a fucking stupid script he had to read. This is supposed to be building up interest in Hulk's match. And everybody on the show is telling him, you may die. Don't do this goddamn match. We don't want to see you a cripple. Yes. And then he said, Bubba actually said, don't be a cripple. Yeah. He was also dropping insider terms left and right, telling Hogan, you're being a mark for yourself. Yes. Then he also said, you promised us you, you would never work again. Yeah. And all I thought was, if he's going to work, he'll be okay. <laughs> God damn horrendous. Uh, horrendous. God, God bless Bubba. And I never thought I would say that. But yes. God bless Bubba, but this was shit. More fully bullshit. Then we had Tomco. There are also it, scattered throughout the show at random points. just 4,000 video recaps of everything. And, and in between here, there was a Foley segment and then a video recap of the band breaking up. Mm-hmm. And it was, they were never on the show again. Yeah. We had more fully bullshit. We had Tom Coe versus Jarrett. No music for Jarrett again. He came out. He worked a babyface match. Tom Coe made a comeback. Jarrett cut him off, pinned him with a sunset flip out of the corner, and they showed Bischoff all pissed off backstage at Jarrett 1. People like Jarrett. They cheered for his win. Not like a, oh. a megastar or anything like that, but he was he was a popular babyface on the show. Yes, yeah, so anyway, I, I, I had zero problem with the match. In fact, this is one of those moments where this is on its way to being perhaps the worst impact ever, and then there was something good on it, which kind of removes it from that list. The negative here, Tomko came out, and they had a camera like shooting up and behind, up at him and from behind as he walked out on the ramp, and my first thought was, wow, they have chosen a camera angle here, seemingly specifically designed to show off his love handles. And then he just got in the ring, and I thought, no, no, he's really that fat. <laughs> and... He's had better days. Our, you can wear a shirt. It's okay. We had another Eric fucking Bischoff segment. <laughs> he met with Hogan. He said, I'm just going to read what I wrote here, because this was another of the most retardedly written things I've ever heard of in my life. He said Hogan was the brand who meant everything to this company, and without him, he wasn't sure anyone could pull this off. In other words, he's saying that without Hogan, the company is dead. <laughs> and it's fucked. He said he needed to rethink the match on Monday because, quote, there's too much at risk. Hogan said, if I don't do it, what brand and what shot do we have? So, again, without Hogan, wrestling, there is no TNA. He said this was different. He'd been called out his entire career. His entire career, he said, was in check. Unless he did this match, he said, quote, there will be no tomorrow. (laughs) This is so, make or break, he said. I am so happy you wrote this down, because I just I, I looked at it and said, this is bullshit, and it summarized it in like one sentence for each guy. He said they punked him out, and what would Eric do if they punked him or his family out? And so Eric finally said, I'll, be, I'll be behind you no matter what you do, and uh, you won't hear another word out of me. Again. I'm not even going to go on. AJ Pope, Nigel, and Abyss, for the world title... Pope was limping around on the bad ankle. Overselling, actually, would be a more appropriate term. So the good guys ran wild, broke down into a four-way. Taz, again, for all Russo talks about reality and storylines, yes. Taz has now talked about how he has not heard from Samoa Joe now in two weeks. Right. In fact, he said, I don't even know if the authorities have been called. Not important enough for you to check? Not important enough for them to mention until halfway through the main event of the fucking television show. So Abyss... My God! Abyss hit the post outside, and then him and Nigel disappeared. <laughs> For like an hour. I mean, they completely vanished, and I actually had to rewind to figure out where the fuck they went. I, 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 honestly, I tried that. I couldn't find them. After going back like three minutes, I said, fuck it, I don't care. The thing was, like, Abyss got sent into the post, which at least explains where he was, but Nigel had sent him into the post, and Nigel also disappeared for two minutes. Yeah. So, Pope and AJ work in the ring. Flair cuts off the Pope, hits his foot with a chair. AJ puts him in the figure four. He taps out. And Uh, the ref stopped it. I'm thinking, why does he deserve another match at the pay-per-view? He won his title match. Uh, He won it at at the pay-per-view, but he got it early. He lost. Why the fuck does he deserve another one? And and more so, why would we care? I don't know. So they killed that feud. I I, I just like you. The match started, and Pope is hopping on one leg. Mm -hmm. And they say, look, you can see Pope is clearly hurt, but the world title shot is too important for him to turn down. 
He has a one-on-one title shot guaranteed to him in a few weeks. Yeah. Where he does not have to fight off Abyss and Nigel McGuinness as well. So Abyss makes a comeback on uh, AJ until Flair starts beating the crap out of him with the barbed wire bat. Yes. Rick Flair grabbed yeah. a barbed wire baseball bat. That angered me more than the idea of him coming back to wrestle. <laughs> Hogan walks down to the ring. He can't run. He walks down to the ring. He gets inside. Flair raises the bat above his head <laughs> and charges. Rick Flair is still the best thing on the show. Flair, I know there's nothing new. Flair charges at Hulk Hogan with a barbed wire bat over his head, and Hulk Hogan merely reaches up and takes the bat away from him and then hits him in the head with it. Yes. What action? <laughs> Flair goes down. He takes a chainsaw to his forehead. He's bleeding everywhere. Oh, God. Of course, Spike has to show as many long shots as possible instead of close-ups of this. And Hogan and Abyss are beating up the heels. They bloody up Flair. And then security comes down, and they beat them up as well. So we talked about this a few days ago. I have now seen it with my own two eyes. And the question remains, as everybody with, with two brain cells to rub together is asked, how is this a go-home angle for March 8th? Hogan and Abyss... To see Flair and AJ get their revenge. Hogan and Abyss got their revenge to set up a match where apparently they will get their revenge again. Get it more. Are we supposed to be watching this to see Flair and AJ get their revenge? Why was Flair bleeding like a motherfucker on the go-home show? And the announcers are like, this is just a tease of what you're going to see on March 8th. Apparently they're going to skin him alive. I was going to say, what? Are they going to cook him? Are they going to put a stick down Flair's mouth and out his ass and put him over a fire and, and cook him and then skin him and eat him? I mean, what what are we waiting for on Monday? Very little, as it turns out. Stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. So the six men all stood there pointing at each other and calling out challenges. And I say six because Pope and Desmond Wolf were still out there. Are they having a match Monday? No, I don't why, think. Why were they out there? AJ or Pope's there yelling at AJ. And I'm like, what are you yelling at him for? You just got beat because you're a fool. Oh, this show sucks. This was a thumbs down. This was, and what an apropos ending to Impact on Thursday nights. <laughs> After all these years on Thursday nights, they're back to a 1.12 with the most god-awful television as shows ever seen. They went out as they should have, as as they lived. They died as they lived. Shitty. I just, I just, I would, I would like to see TNA succeed. It really would be nice to have another wrestling promotion that provided good programming. I don't want to see this this version of Impact succeed. No. But it doesn't matter because it won't. Right. I don't give a fuck what anybody listening to this thinks is going to happen on Monday nights. Have you learned absolutely nothing? I, January 4th was a month and a half ago, for God's sake. Two months ago now. January 4th was two months ago, and it's like the day never happened. Nobody learned a goddamn thing from it. Everybody's sitting here talking about how, man, on, and once they move to Monday nights, all those Raw viewers are going to have this, this opportunity to check them out. Yeah, they had it on January 4th, and nobody was switching back and forth. Nobody was switching back and forth. The Impact people watched their show. The WWE people watched their show. The Impact people picked up some viewers when it was unopposed, but then they all moved to Raw. There's going to be no unopposed hour anymore. It's going to be head-to-head the entire two hours. And this is the programming. This is the programming that they're going to steal Raw fans. This? When, when Impact first went to two hours, watching it would make me angry. And I would swear and curse and stomp and throw tantrums and slap the four like a four-year-old. And uh, this show made me angry like that again. That's sad. So fuck you, Impact. <laughs> Wait till Monday night. Wait. To the back! I don't want to go through every every thread on the board where somebody says something I disagree with, but I'm going to I'm going to make light or not make light. I'm going to uh, I'm going to highlight a a statement here by Tarmus, who was written: Why does TNA have to beat Raw in the ratings for the decision to move Impact to Monday nights to be called a success? Why isn't both shows on head to head, spring each other to be a better show in the long run? A good thing for TNA to have done. Well, here's the problem, Tarmus. It is a myth that if Raw and Impact go head-to-head, it's going to spur both shows to to book better programming. That's a lie. That's not going to happen. It didn't happen on January 4th. 
and it didn't happen on March 8th. WWE is known for months that TNA is going live on March 8th. It's not a mystery. I mean, not months, at least a month or so. If you look at, like, after next week when they've got Steve Austin, three WrestleMania main events, and the Brett Vince contract signing, if you look at that in the previous three Raws, the Raw where they did the least was the show where Impact debuted on Monday nights. Raw and WWE, they don't care. There's no war here. Do you understand? There's no war. It, 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 actually, it was patently obvious today, and it was patently obvious going in that there was not going to be a war. Nobody in their right mind, not a single person in the world, thought that Impact was going to beat Raw. Most people thought it was going to do, I predicted a 1.16. Which, ironically, if they do the same DVR numbers that they did on January 4th, that would be a 1.19. Very close. It's also very very specific. But. Yeah. Now, I, uh, it didn't. It did a point nine eight because it's not a war. WWE did not try to counter-program. WWE is not going to see what TNA's main event is next week, and they're going to try and book something to beat them. They don't care. So the idea that Raw is going to book better programming because Impact is going head-to-head, that's not going to happen. It's and not true. I would actually argue they're doing the opposite. Exactly. There were times during the show where I thought their goal was to put on a boring episode of Raw and still crush Impact, and that's exactly what happened. They may That may have been their mindset. When they're o- opening match, again, a women's six-man tag, given plenty of time, they, they knew that was not going to be good. Chris Angel and, and all those guys doing those skits, they were begging people to tune Impact. Yes. No one did. No, they because were... Because it's not a war. Begging is the wrong word. Daring people to turn into Impact. But on, no one did. On top of that, by the way, on top of that, Raw does not spur Impact to do better shows. That's clear. We've now seen two head-to-head impacts. And what has TNA done both times? They've hot shot a bunch of shit that they couldn't follow up on, or they forgot to follow up on, or they're just incompetent. And they followed up January 4th, where they did a 1-3 head-to-head, with March 8th, where they did a .98 head-to-head. Raw did not spur them to put on better shows. It spurred them to do exactly what the worst thing you could possibly do is, which is hot shot bullshit. Do you look at the impact tapings? My God, they look horrible. <laughs> you don't say. The main event of, of uh, spoiler alert, everybody, not that anyone could possibly care, the main event of impact next week is, I think it's Jeff Hardy pins AJ Styles, which would be a week before AJ Styles and Abyss at the pay-per-view. These people have no idea what they're doing. No. Oh. What happens? They they put Kurt Angle and uh, Ken Kennedy in a in a tag match, and uh, and Kennedy beats up Angle and bloodies him with the metal. Again? Did we not see this three weeks Isn't ago? That how it started? They blew up the entire feud on Monday night. They had the whole fucking United States Army out there <laughs> yes. beating the shit out of Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. It's over. You would think. They followed it up with Kennedy getting the heat on Kurt again. Yeah. Who could possibly care now? I don't know. These people have absolutely no idea what you're doing. You wonder why they got a point nine eight. They don't know what they're doing. Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Let me give everybody a, a stat here. Hogan and Flair did not do a 1.01. The overrun of Hogan and Flair did a 1.01. When Hulk Hogan, Flair, AJ, and Abyss came down to the ring for that main event on Monday night, that segment did an 0.76. That's no good. The beginning and the bulk of that match did an 0.76. Why? Well, there are many reasons, actually. One of them was that everybody decided that watching... John Cena faced Jack Swagger, Mark Henry in the peanut gallery, along with Vince McMahon on Raw. 4.0 to uh, 1.0 in the overrun. 3.6 to point seven. What did I say? Point seven six. I don't have the number in front of me. It was, it was point seven. Point seven six is what you said. Something like that. I got him here somewhere, but that was one of the reasons. And number one is because you got a fucking go home show. It was point seven six, by the way. I got him here. You had a go home show. You got a go home show for this big March 8th event. And what do they do? They have Hulk Hogan and Abyss beat the shit out of Ric Flair, bloody him up, and leave him in a broken heap. 
We need to see the match. Why? Don't know. You spent the entire show telling people that Hulk Hogan was old and broken down. Right. Well, he is. And shockingly, what did that segment do? When? What happened? How did that segment start that it a point seven six? Why? Everybody was telling Hulk he shouldn't go out there. He's old and broken down. Everybody turned the fucking channel. You told him to turn the channel. You assholes. You told him to turn the fucking channel. Not to mention the big YouTube thing. First five minutes. Oh, you make sure you watch the first five minutes. First five minutes. Do you see this thing? The first five minutes with Borash? I, I did not see the YouTube clip. I heard it. It was actually a, a, it was a pretty creative little clip. Bischoff's or, 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 uh, or Borash, Borash is in the bathroom. And he's that sounds his, awesome. He's on his, of course, every skit has to be in the bathroom on impact. Mm-hmm. He's on his cell phone, and somebody calls and says, something big's happening in the first five minutes, but it's a secret. Of course, everything's a fucking secret on the show. That's why nobody watches it. But anyway, they say, don't tell anybody the secret. He goes, don't worry, I won't tell anybody there's a big thing in the first five minutes of the show. Of course, someone's in the stall next to him. They call their friend. Their friend calls another friend. It's this big thing where you see everybody telling everybody else. And finally, at the end of the clip, Borash is walking down the hall and some stranger comes over and says, Hey, don't tell anybody this, but the first five minutes impact, something big is going to happen. And Borash is like, Oh, I fucked up. Pretty creative little segment. Okay. Pretty creative little segment. Yeah, you know what that did? 9,000 views on YouTube. They didn't put it on Impact, which does 1.5 million viewers. They put it on YouTube. It got 9,000 viewers, which I think may be less than the Brian and Vinny battle has gotten in history. And, of course, the opening segment on Impact, what did the first five minutes get? 0.99. Way to go, guys. Way to go. So, you would think, well, they don't think, but... That does a point nine nine. I guess it was probably a little too late since the ratings came out on Tuesday. But you know they they build for next week on Impact on Monday night. Nothing. Right. I don't remember a I single do. match they announced for next Monday. Not a single match. I was just happy they ran out matches for the pay per view in two weeks or whatever it is. And maybe next week. Oh yeah, the the pay per view that's coming up where where the uh, I know four matches now. Okay, so so it's Abyss versus AJ. Yeah. And then next week in the main event, Jeff Hardy pins AJ. Right. Why the fuck would you do that? Because they're retarded. Because you don't know what you're doing. Yes. I'm just astounded. I'm astounded that anybody expected this to do anything different. They have done the same stupid shit over and over, week after week, month after month, year after year, year after year. Years Pe- of my life taken away. How many sh- Brian and Vinny shows have you listened to where we have skewered impact for this dumb shit? All of them. Okay, so they do this week after week after week, and people still think that suddenly something's going to change. They're suddenly going to get a great number. People are suddenly going to start watching the show. I remember, I remember when they announced that Hogan and Flair was going to be on free TV March 8th. And I thought, how stupid. Why don't you dumbasses put this on pay-per-view and try and pop a rating? People pointed out, well, Brian, obviously you were wrong. You know what? You're right. I was wrong. I was wrong. Because if they had put that match on pay-per-view, let's say they, they announced that match for lockdown. You know how badly they would have killed interest in that match in a month and a half? It took them two weeks to kill the interest in the match for Monday night. Yes. People talking about, man, they they, they got to put this match on Monday because you know they got to establish themselves on Monday nights. They got to get a they got to get a real big number and get people talking and watching the show. You really thought that was going to happen? I mean, did you really think that was going to happen? It's not like I didn't predict this. If anything, I fucked up because I, I expected them to do better. My standards were still too high. My standards were still too high. My standards were still too high. Look at the quarters here. We talked about this earlier. In the first hour and 45 minutes, nobody switched channels. Nobody even switched from Raw to Impact during a Chris Angel segment. Nobody even switched from Impact to Raw. Until the final 15 minutes of the show when they carted Hogan and Flair out to the ring yet again. Hogan's first match since the Orton match. Flair's first match since WrestleMania. Their first match together since since 1999 or whatever. Point seven six, A point seven six. Again, why would anyone need to watch this match? We saw the blow off the Thursday before on that god-awful fucking show. That was the only segment where people switched channels. They switched from Impact to Raw to watch Vince Cena and all the goof. All the goofballs. All the goof. All the goof. The goof troop. It's 
There's no, there's no hope, everybody. No, I've been telling well, you this hope. for years. You get rid of the dumb shits putting the show together, and there's hope. But it will never happen, Brian. Well, it's going to happen, actually, because the theory, and this is a grand theory, the grand theory is that the reason that Bischoff and Hogan kept Russo around was because as soon as this shit went down, he's a scapegoat and they get rid of him. Great! <laughs> Whatever gets the job done. I cannot conceive of a human being walking the face of this earth that could write a worse wrestling TV show. I went to SmackDown tonight. I've been to a lot of, of WWE shows in Seattle. This was by far the smelliest. These people had the worst body odor. I would trust every single one of them to write Impact over over Vince Russo. Mm-hmm. There's never been a bigger failure in the history of this business. And when people go, well, Brian, how can he be such a big failure? He's, he's still got a job today. Yeah, he's employed by people that are somehow stupider than he is. Because they don't understand that when you do the same fucking numbers over and over, actually the numbers are getting worse. When the numbers are getting worse, nobody buys your pay-per-views, and you still have the guy write your TV, you deserve everything you fucking get. They get rid of that guy, and maybe there's hope. Maybe there's hope. I, I still think... How much fucking talent is on this show? A ton. It's astounding that this fucking show did worse than NXT last week. Which has rookies. Rookies. Visit. Wade Barrett. David Otunga. These They're guys, young. These guys are beating Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Sting, Rob Van Dam, uh, Kurt Angle. Nash, Angle, Foley. The list goes on and on. How is it fucking possible that all of that talent is losing to NXT? Because the fucking guy putting your show together is a numbskull. Yeah. You. We've been saying this for years. <laughs> what does it fucking take? Hey, they, uh, do that, they have to do a point one? That's what I'm trying to say. Panda Energy will pull the plug before they fire Vince Russo. I, 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 they'll fire Russo first. I, I don't think they have I, to. I don't. They would have by now. As long as he's only been there for three months, he's been there for years. Well, no. Here's why they wouldn't. Because there was always that fucking golden carrot. It was never Russo's fault. It was always like, if only we had Hulk Hogan. If only we had Ric Flair. If only we had Monday nights. Well, guess what? You have all those. I know. Now they do, though. And it's going down. Now they've got everything. What more is there? Except if Vince McMahon took over. What more could you possibly get? John Cena? That ain't happening, okay? That wouldn't matter. What else could you possibly get? You're going head to fucking head with Vince McMahon on Monday night with Hogan and Flair and everybody. What more could you possibly get? Nothing. Therefore, they've hit the wall. Something's got to give. And it's got to be Vince Russo. And for the people that are talking about, I know that Spike TV sent out something today. And they're talking about how the male, damage control. The, male, the male demos are up. They, everything's fine. The male demos are up. Yes. The male demos are up by 5% and 11%. First off, whoopty fucking do. Second off, number one, the rating is down, so they're making less ad money. Number two, they're going live every other week, which is a great added expense. 5% and 11% in a demo is not even coming close to offsetting that. As much as people want to try and claim that everything is fine, this number is a disaster. And what well, do you, not for me. What do you fucking think this number is going to be next week? I hope we got a point Steve seven. Steve Austin, Vince McMahon and Bret Hart contract signing. Three WrestleMania rematches. Shawn Michaels versus Chris Jericho on Raw. What do you think a tape impact is going to do up against that? They may get a point five. Then what? I will do a dance. Then what's the spin going to be? What's the spin going to be? We're doing better than we were doing before we got TV. That's true. That's true. Except before you had TV, you were doing fucking better pay-per-view numbers. I have no idea why I'm ranting about this right now. Honestly, I don't either. I have no idea why I'm still, after all these years, yelling. Because Well, I know that because you're an angry little man. No, because I want to fucking see a good impact. You can't. i got to watch this show every week. I would like it to be good. 
it's so frustrating to see all this fucking talent squandered on a shit show. I don't want to watch that. People, I would love, I would be the happiest fucking man in the world if TNA produced a great show every week and they were doing a four. I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Because I don't know if anybody realizes this or not, but when wrestling does well, I make a lot of money. <laughs> I would like it to do great. If the wrestling business right now was doing as well as the wrestling business was doing in the 90s, I would have a gold boat. I would have a boat made out of gold in an airplane. And I would have a fucking, I would have houses everywhere. I would be rolling in money. A gold boat. Yes. I would have a boat made out of solid gold. <laughs> see, I can see I don't this. even give a fuck if it sinks. Well, I would have it. I don't see it. I see you owning a gold boat, but it's not tied up in a dock somewhere. It's just in your front yard. Yeah, just be sitting right out there. I'd have palm trees in my fucking front yard in Washington, and I'd have a golden boat tied to the palm trees. I would love if this business was doing great. I would love if Impact was doing a four and Raw was doing a four and it was a great show every week. I would be so fucking happy. Why do people think I'm biased against TNA like I want it to die? Why would I want it to die? Well, perhaps they're confusing I you and I. I want this bullshit TNA that I'm watching right now to go away forever and a good TNA to appear in its place. Sweet Christ, WWE got rid of ECW. And it was doing better than Impact did this week. And they tried out NXT. Let's try something different. Let's try something different. Let's try and make something. This one's obviously not working. Let's try to make something work. And so far it is. It'll fail soon enough, I'm sure. But for now, it's different and it's better. The same shit week after week. Let's talk about the SmackDown tapings. I don't even want to talk about last night's Impact. It was, a, it was shit, everybody. Uh, pretty much, yeah. There was a fun X Division match. Um, I, I, I there's one thing I want to say about this show that, uh, the dumb shits on the board were arguing about. And actually, that's not even true. There's really one dumb shit, and other people on the board were pointing out what a dumb shit he was. But someone was saying, I don't see how Rob Van Dam was buried because he was hit with a baseball bat. So, of course, you know, it was natural that he would be on the ground. To anyone who feels that way about the segment, if you, if you missed the show, we'll recap. Sting was in the ring to take on a mystery opponent. It was such a mystery, the fans were chanting RVD. Sure enough, the music played, RVD's name appeared on the graphic. Rob Van Dam came through the crowd. He hit that one jumping kick where it looks like he's going to break his leg, but he never does. He hit the rolling thunder. He pinned Sting. People were going crazy, jumping up and down, chanting his name. And then Sting hit him with a baseball bat several times. Killed him into oblivion. Hogan came out to, I guess, make the save. The refs held Hogan back. As Sting continued to hit a man with a baseball bat. Security did not care about that. And the focus was all on Sting and Hogan. Rob Van Dam was usually not on camera. And when it was, he was being beaten with a baseball bat. Yeah, he would lay on his back and he would hold his stomach and he would kick his feet. Probably saying, ow, my ribs. Ow! And then every now and then he would start to get up and they'd hit him again. Yeah. And he'd lay down there and kick his feet for a while. Then he'd start to get up and they'd kick him again. Mm -hmm. And this went on for like five minutes and then he disappeared never to be seen again. Yeah. Now, for those of you who think this is not a burial because he was taken out with a baseball bat, in a minute, they went from the fans chanting his name, going ballistic, happy to see him, to him being an afterthought, a complete afterthought, as Sting squared off with Hulk Hogan. In 2010. In 2010. That is a burial. How you got there is irrelevant. <laughs> At the end of the day, Rob Van Dam showed up and was buried a minute in. Not to mention, I think it's the same dipshit. It's Why talking would you about sign a guy and pay him money? Because they have no idea what they're doing. And then, I, and I, I'm all, I, frankly, I'm a little confused that Rob did not just pack his bags and leave. The same dipshit goes, he beat Sting. <laughs> no, no one, and no one will remember this. <laughs> he beat Sting. Dude. He fluke pinned him. Sting kicked out at 3.1. He didn't sell a thing, and no. he immediately beat up the guy he, with he a bat. He got to his feet, got his bat, and started beating up Rob Van Dam. What a he, victory. Yeah, he, he was not, this man was not beaten in any way, by, I, by which I mean Sting. 
Rob Van Dam is beaten savagely. He, he was savagely beaten. So it it's sucks show. to be him. I'm sure he wishes he'd just stay retired. Uh, there was that <laughs> that god awful beer money versus Jeff Jarrett segment. Yeah. Where I was so happy when I heard you tear this apart later. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I watched this in a state of complete bewilderment. I have never <laughs> there were four people involved, I believe, Jeff Jarrett, Mick Foley, and Beer Money, and I did not understand the motivations of any of them. <laughs> I don't either. And, 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 and throw Bischoff in there, because apparently he put this all together. But I just, it went on for like six minutes, and I stared there at my screen shouting, what is going on here? Yes. And I thought I had missed a segment. So where, did I. Where your beer money had turned heel. No, they're, 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 but, I, I thought I'd missed a segment where they announced this match. All I that, saw that was too. Jeff Jarrett went up to beer money, and he's like, uh, I just want you to know that I, I wasn't. I, 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 it, this match was not my idea. And I'm like, what match? What in the fuck's going on? And Beer Money all of a sudden are heels yeah. for like literally no reason. They go out there. It's Beer Money against Jeff Jarrett in uh, a handicap match with Mick Foley in a suit and tennis shoes as the ref. Right. What? I don't know. I, I wrote down what happened. I wrote, I don't have any idea what happened in this segment. And then I wrote, I feel like I have tuned into an alternate universe TNA with completely different storylines. You may this have. This was the Elseworld version of TNA. A bad show, everybody. One, just the usual. Just the usual. To the back! All right, start on, uh, why don't we start on this goddamn Impact show? All Let's right. talk about this great show. This show opened with an amazing shot of Hulk Hogan, Abyss... Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy driving up to Impact in a gold Hummer, and they all got out, and they were all dressed in their wrestling gear. Jeff Hardy had makeup on, Abyss had his mask on, and as Taz pointed out, Abyss was driving. Yeah. And and Taz was wise in knowing that, that Abyss was driving, and that's funny by itself, but I thought it was hysterical he was driving with his mask on. Well, what else and, would he do? He's always got his mask on. Th- this is one of those times... I was desperate for a skit of pro wrestlers being themselves out in the real world. If they had gone through a drive through or <laughs> stopped for gas and just gotten out and been abyss, Hulk Hogan, Rob Van Dam, and Jeff Hardy, much better than anything on the show. Guaranteed. Just, there's, something about, there's something about Jeff Hardy and RVD sitting in the back seat. It was so goofy. <laughs> it's like they just... I, I realize this is about as nitpicky as you could possibly get, but I saw... I saw a Hummer pull up with Abyss driving, Hulk Hogan in the driver's seat, and those two guys just get out of the back seat, and I thought, what dorks? <laughs> because the people in the back seat are always dorks. Well, I know, just sort of like... You want know, a car with four front seats? Well, no, okay. It makes sense to me that Hulk Hogan would have a lackey to drive him around. Abyss. It totally makes sense to me. Shouldn't, like, Jeff Hardy, of all people, be a big enough star to have his own moped or something? His own dirt bike? Moped. That he shows up on? You think Jeff Hardy is showing up on a moped? Something. Like, a, like, one, a moped a, made out of gold. How about a Segway? Was there a Segway available? See, these seeds, not a Segway. Oh, Jeff, Jeff Hardy should have his own ride. He should be having a carpool with Abyss and Hulk Hogan. It could have been a limo. Could have been. That would have been better. If it would have been a stretch Humvee, I would have been a little. I would have been fine with this. But just the the regular Humvee. Only if Abyss was still driving. They had to shove this goofball that's into the, the back key, seat. That's the key to me. But you can put Jeff Hardy behind the wheel. Well, he's been known to, uh, you know. By the time most of you read this, Jeff Hardy may be in the clink. Or listen <laughs> to this. I'm sorry. He's uh, he's actually seriously. By the time most of you hear this, he'll be either be in court or he will have been sentenced. I or acquitted in I one day. Say. Well. I, I, I admit really, I've not been following it closely. You really expect this trial to be dragging out over a number of days? It seems to me that most trials do. This is this is North Carolina. He's on a drug trafficking charge. I can't fathom this going that long. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. I'm not a lawyer. I pictured being over and done with in an hour. They go, you had X amount by the letter of the law. <laughs> what were you doing with all these drugs? Yeah. Ingesting them. Guilty. Who knows? Who knows? All I know is that the, the, uh, the laws down there are very strict. Hmm. And and uh, people I've talked to are are concerned that he's fucked, but he may not be. He may not be because he's Jeff Hardy and he's got a shitload of money. He's probably got a great lawyer, and maybe he didn't even do it. There's a, there's a story. I, I'm not even saying that Jeff is guilty. I mean, it is a fact that these these things were found in his home. That's a fact. But it could in fact have been that they were planted there as as or or somebody. Uh, you know, he was framed. He was framed. That's the word that they use. That's the story that he told, and perhaps he was. We'll find out what the courts think here very soon. 
So, AJ and Flair came out for a promo. I believe this has opened Impact for like six weeks in a row now. Mm -hmm. There's a template for this show. There is, yes. AJ and Flair always opened the promo. AJ started talking about how there was no magical ring that was going to help Abyss. Said he had had classic battles in the Asylum and in the Impact Zone, but AJ had won every time. He said he did not believe in the Easter Bunny, he did not believe in Santa Claus, and he did not believe in magical rings. He did believe that he is the best in the world and a gift from God. And it was all things considered a fine AJ Styles promo. Fun of his better ones. But then Ric Flair spoke. And it was better. Yeah. That's and he was problem. very crazy. He said he was bleeding last week. He was sure to point out that he was bleeding because he hit a guardrail, not because Hulk Hogan hit him. Then he started punching himself to open the wound again, and he bled like crazy here in this promo. Mm. This man's certifiable. So he uh, said he hated Jeff Hardy. He said if Jeff wanted to play ball here, he could expect this every day. And I thought, what, you bleeding? I think he'll get by. I think worse things have happened to Jeff Hardy than Ric Flair bleeding. So Jeff came out to his shitty, shitty TNA theme song. AJ called him a nobody, which was funny for a few reasons. And then AJ, who last I checked was the heel, challenged Jeff to a wrestling match. One-on-one, let's fight. And uh, Jeff accepted. And then Ric Flair told him to go to the back, paint a picture, and get high. Yeah. Trial, everyone. <laughs> it, it, I, they scripted this line for Jeff Hardy two days before his drug trafficking trial. <laughs> Is Go backstage, possible? he said, and get high on paint. Are we sure that was not just a, a spur of the moment thing? It may have been. I, 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 Either way, I like it was a taped show. It, that's true. <laughs> that is true. It was a taped show. So they left it in there. Well, actually, you know what? I take it back. It probably was scripted because then Jeff said he would be flying high on the backs of the creatures of the night, which is apparently what he calls his fans now. And then he made an incomprehensible sound. <laughs> he warbled. He howled. And <laughs> And they played his music. He is a unique fellow. So, aside aside from the minor detail of the heel issuing the challenge, this was fine. Then we had a segment of Bischoff yelling at Foley for helping Jarrett. I had no idea what was going on here. I didn't care. All I know is that when it was over, there was a commercial for a new season of Deadliest Warrior. Awesome. He was very upset about something Foley did last week. And... I swear to God, all I remember is that there was a Beer Money Jarrett match, and Foley was wearing a goofy ref shirt. That's literally the only thing yeah. I remember. I, I oh, wa- you know what? I do remember. He gave me a barbed wire bat. Anyway, point is, it would have been nice to, you know, tell us what happened I, or show us. Because, I mean, clearly no one watched the show last week, so right. fucking help us out here. But, but we, no, I, I watched this, and it ended, and I, thought, I said I have no idea what they're talking about or what it resolved, and I don't care. I never crossed my mind to go back and check. The yeah. footage of the Nasties beating up Jesse Neal. I must correct you. Jimmy Hart jumped Jesse Neal from behind. The Nasties joined in later, but Jimmy Hart had things well in hand. Yeah. So Jesse Neal, the big tattooed Mohawk pro wrestler who used to be a Marine, got beat up by a 60-some-year-old man. Yeah. A small 60-some-year-old man. Mm-hmm. So they laid him out and put him to a table. And then, we, then we got, it was going to be the Nasty Boys and Jimmy Hart versus Team 3D. Wasn't it Team 3D and Jesse Neal, but that's why they laid Jesse Neal Jesse Neal was supposed to be their partner, yes. Somehow this was supposed to be a fair match. Yes, again, Jesse Neal, the tattooed Mohawk ex-Marine pro wrestler, was a fair match for the sexagenarian Jimmy Hart. Yeah. So. Astounding. Instead, they got Brother Runt. So it's a good thing they knew Jesse Neal was going to be laid out and they should fly their brother in. Sure. Everything worked out. So they had a match. There's so little thinking done yeah. when putting this program together. But it's just or maybe too much. Do a surprise. <laughs> okay? Just well, no, just, I mean, nobody thought, why is Brother Runt happened to be here when Jesse Neal happens to be laid out? Like, nobody, of course they didn't. Or if they did, they just said, the fans won't think about this. Well, I just did! Yeah. So, I, I don't think Devon even tagged in. They had a match. It was There was not much to it. Uh it ended, and there was a big six-way brawl going on, and uh, Bubba got whacked with the motorcycle helmet or the mug of megaphone or something, and Jimmy Hart pinned him. Mm-hmm. Team 3D will not do a job in Japan. No. But Team 3D pinning Bubba in the States? Jimmy Hart pinning Bubba in the States. Bubba knows nothing on this shit matters. That is true. Yeah. He, he just, 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 just pay me. And then, and then, so they, they knock out Bubba with a helmet. Jimmy Hart pins him. Heat is achieved, and then the babyface make a big comeback and put sags to a table. Yes, just Neil also showed up. He's, he's fine. 
Yeah, he runs out, he's limp a little bit, but now he's all right. Yes, and they put Cyrus to the table, and the good guys end up winning anyway. So the bad guys won the match, the good guys won the post-match, and as my note freed, well, that all accomplished nothing. Absolutely nothing. Angelina was mad. Maybe she saw that segment. She should an open challenge to any of the beautiful people, but especially Velvet. Yes. So why not just challenge Velvet? <laughs> yeah, it is actually it was even more irritating to me, but she, she said, I challenge any beautiful person, especially Velvet, and then she said, and it doesn't matter which one. Make up your mind! <laughs> so, Borash interviewed Hall and Waltman in a horrifying segment. <laughs> Waltman... <laughs> Waltman said they have been kicked out of better places than TNA. <laughs> yeah. Burying the company deep beneath the earth. He said he made an inside reference to Bischoff firing him from WCW via FedEx that, based on this audience, I just don't know if anybody knew what he was talking about. I believe that was 15 years ago. <laughs> Something like that, yes. 14? And it wasn't there. even like, and that was 15 years ago. That was an insider story from 15 years ago. That wasn't even like an angle from 15 years ago. I've... It's, Maybe Xbox it, announced it on Raw when uh, he showed up. I'm thinking his, his very first promo, I think he talked about it. But still, that was one time 15 right. years ago. So they ended up with Nash. Even though he's getting a match with Hall on Sunday, he said, I'll give you 25000 to get in the ring tonight, and I'll give it to you if you can last five minutes with me. Now, what that means, I don't know. What does that mean, if you can last five minutes? Does he have to knock him out, pin him, submit him? I don't know. But that's what he said, and... Hall took the offer. All right. We had Angle, Pope against Desmond, and WW LSD, <laughs> Mr. Anderson. And they had a match. It was uh, pretty good. And, of course, the finish was Nigel going for the figure four on Pope. Pope rolled him up. One, two, three. And, of course, heels attacked the baby faces. And Mr. Anderson, who was beaten, humiliated, and attacked by the entire U.S. Army last week. He took the medal. He cut Kurt open. Second guy gigging in the first hour of the same show. And uh, this is supposed to set up us caring about them having a match on Sunday. All I know is I that don't at all. Since the last pay-per-view, this now they're exactly back where they started. Mr. Anderson has attacked Kurt Angle and made him bleed with a medal. Yeah. Everything that's happened since then is rendered null and void. We are right back where we started. And Mike Disney even pointed this out, that we had seen this exact thing before. Yeah. Just a... Just a there was a lot of that tonight with... Just with a clown show. Largely Taz playing the role of, of me. Yeah. Asking, yes. why is this shit happening? So the, the match was fun. I could, I could stand seeing Kurt Angle and the Pope as a tag team every week, and that would not hurt my feelings. But the booking continues to blow. Hogan... Told Jeff and RV to go out and have fun tonight. <laughs> it's hilarious. And then Hulk and Rob had a long discussion of regional high five etiquette. Yeah. I, it, it's one of those things where they just kept talking and Rob left, then poked his head back to talk some more, and I thought, how did this air? <laughs> they didn't reshoot this. It gets better later. So Bishop walked in and wanted to make sure they were on the same page. Hogan said, yeah. Hulk, Eric said, if you're going to bring in surprises, clue me in, it'd be nice. It'd be nice if you clued the fans in. That's what he should have said. <laughs> Next time you fucking bring in Rob Van Dam, will you fucking advertise it in advance, you dumbass? Yes, so he kissed Hulk's ass for a while, and then he left, and Hulk sighed and said, that was weird. Which that needs to, we, need, we need a drop of that, and we need to play it after every bit on the show. I want a drop of, of Hulk Hogan saying, and I quote, what went down last week was more than just a train wreck. <laughs> that was a good one, too. Angelina against Daphne. This, this was match shit. was this was fucking bullshit. I don't Terrible. want to talk about this. Terrible. The beautiful people announced they were giving an honorary membership to Daphne, who had been hiding under the ring. A minute in, she pulled out a toolbox. That's not a metaphor. A box of tools, and began to pick one. And she finally picked one, and got in the ring, and the ref took it away. And then the bad girls got disqualified for interfering anyway. And then they beat her up for a while. Daphne tried to do the spot where you you whip them into the, the entrance ramp, I guess. Only she's not strong enough to hold Angelina up, so she dropped her on on her head on the floor. That looked brutal. And then Tara saved. So this sucked in every single way. I was just, I had a, a terribly classless joke in my head, and I, I can't even bring myself to make it. I will note that they pulled Angelina vagina first into the post, and she sold it. And Taz said, Would that hurt a girl? Would that even hurt a girl? Mike Snay said, I don't know. 
Your delivery was better than theirs. So, this was an amazing segment. You will recall, the last week Rob Van Dam debuted on this show and was immediately buried deep beneath the earth when Sting beat up with a baseball bat and he was, he being Rob Van Dam, became the pawn in the Sting-Hogan war. So this is the week where they give Rob his heat back. All right. So, Actually, I want to talk a little bit about this, the beginning of th- this. There is more to it. Yes, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hogan calls out Sting. Sting is in the rafters. He demands he come down. Sting took like three to four minutes to come down from the rafters and get in the ring. Now, yes. in discussing this with Dave last night, he explained that, well, you see, they wanted Sting to step into the ring at exactly 10 o'clock. Not, not a minute before. So, therefore, they had to show him walking around for three minutes to kill the time until 10 o'clock. Now, first off, all I know is that I was cooking dinner at the time, and I looked up, and I, I saw Sting in the rafters, and I put my food in the microwave, and it cooked, and I took it out of the microwave, and he still hadn't been in the ring yet. And I thought, how is anyone not turned the channel right now? I don't know. They thought that this was something that would, that would build viewership. By having him take four minutes to walk to the ring. Anyway, for those of you that checked out the quarter hours, this backfired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stun. It, Stunning. It, it dropped when he got in the ring. People do not want to see Sting walking. Well, they, they, they wanted to see. I mean, these were the highest rated quarters of the show, so they do care a little bit about Hogan and Sting. But they, they did not have this giant bump at 10 o'clock like mm-hmm. they were expecting. It actually went yes. down. So Sting finally made it to floor level and was approaching the ring. When suddenly, who should attack him but Robert Van Dam? He jumped him from behind like a coward. He beat him up for a while all around the ring. And, you know, last week, again, Sting hit him with a bat. And Rob Van Dam disappeared as Sting and Hulk had a face-off. So this is Rob's big chance to, you know, establish himself as a star once again. He jumps Sting from behind like a coward, beats him up a little bit, and then throws him into the ring so Hulk Hogan can beat him up. And then Rob Van Dam disappears. Never to be seen again. Oh, my God. <laughs> it... I, I I was even I was taken aback by how stupid this was. They couldn't have him throw Sting in the ring and a flog frog splash. No, he threw Sting in the ring and said, "Well, that's my paycheck for the week," and he went back to change. So then Hogan gets a bat and he's going to beat up Sting, and Bischoff comes out to make the save for Sting, telling Hogan he's not a wrestler anymore. He needs to stop getting involved with stuff in the ring. He tells security to take Sting away. They do so, and Sting goes voluntarily. <laughs> And Hogan just stands there and looks sad about his career being over as the people chant his name, and Bischoff gives him a guilt trip about how he'd promised his daughter he was done with it. Yes, he, he said, you promised your daughter you wouldn't wrestle anymore, and they cut to a shot of said daughter who was clapping and chanting her father's name. Yeah. That did not look like a girl who wanted her dad to retire. To quote Bischoff, or Hogan earlier, actually, that was weird. <laughs> that segment right there. <laughs> that was weird. This was a fail. Hernandez... I forget what he said, but my notes read, Hernandez tells Jarrett that beer money segment was bullshit. I can't argue. Yes, he <laughs> said, if you want a partner tonight, I'll I'll be your partner. And this was Jarrett. And they're about to go to the ring, and Bischoff comes up and says, you ain't booking no more. So he signed Hernandez to the handicap match with beer money. And he told Jeff he was going to be the referee. And he actually said, he actually said, this was how your career began. What, a, what amazing timing. Fascinating coincidence. Yes. And it was a complete coincidence because this was taped before we had watched Jared's debut. Yes. It's baffling to me. Coincidences happen, everybody. So they uh, had the Nash Hall match. It was ungodly awful. They they built it as a five-minute challenge, but, of course, they couldn't put a clock on the screen because it was so bad they edited it down to three minutes. And Waltman handcuffed Nash to the ropes. Well, I just, Okay. Eric went to make the save. See, I just assumed that was the finish, and so it did not go. It did not go five minutes. No, because Hall took the money. I thought he was just a thief. All I know is, as bad I didn't as even know the rules were. <laughs> <laughs> as bad as this was, all I could think was, it went three minutes, and I thought to myself, you know, these these men had a match much worse than what this a decade ago, and that was on pay per view. So I couldn't get very mad about this one. I'm just laughing that Hall and Nash went supposedly. Five minutes, and they only gave Waltman and Eric Young one minute last week. That is also good comedy. Like, what person in their right mind could look at those two matches and decide that Hall and Nash deserved five times as long? 
<laughs> that not. right there is grounds for firing if I were in charge. I would say grounds for waterboarding. If I went, like, it will never happen, nor would I accept the job. But if if they hired me to come and take over, I'd go through that place with a flaming sword. There would be bodies hitting the floor right and left. Just one person axed after another. You, done. You, done. You, done. You, done. There'd be like ten people working there by the time I was finished. Then they'd be in real trouble. But maybe not. Maybe they'd be better off with those ten people. I was just astounded. I mentioned on another show today the stats I got. Raw has, I think, 88 active performers. And they've got three shows. You mean WWE? WWE. Okay. What did I say? You said Raw. Well, WWE. So. Yeah, they have they have 88 active performers over three shows. Mm-hmm. And TNA's got, I think the stat was 67 over, over one, one show. show. <laughs> You're gone. Yeah. You're gone. You're gone. You're gone. Yeah, that's you're right. hired. Now you're gone. It's a struggle to uh, get, you know, they, they have talked about how hard it is to get everyone on the show every week. And fire people. Air Money and Hernandez with Jared as referee. Morgan did commentary and didn't care at all about his partner. So hopefully he actually turns heel and this is not a swerve and they turn Hernandez heel because that would be really bad. So, poor man. Thank you, Brian, for explaining that. Hernandez made a comeback. Yeah, it was a poor match. It was, it was fine. I thought it was, it was a fun handicap match. Sure. About four minutes. Beer money beat him up. That was that was a moment there where I was completely biased. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. So but I, yes. I do. I will. I will. Uh, I will. I will state here that it was a fine match. Yes. They, they, they beat him up for a while. He made a big strong comeback until they cut him off because there's two of them and they hit the DWI in one. And uh, finally, uh, they were beating him up afterwards until Jarrett made the save and chased them off. This was a good segment. What does the DWI stand for? Uh, drinking while investing. That's what they call it. The name of their finishing. You're not listening move? to the announcers ever. I, well, it's the suplex neckbreaker thing or powerbomb neckbreaker. Well, I know that, but I didn't know that they'd given an actual name. the The initials DWI. I didn't know if they'd explain what those were. Drinking while investing. Beer money. But I mean, there's no drinking or investing in that move. Well, no. They could. It, it, they they decided they would have a move called the DWI and then picked a move for I it. I guess it doesn't matter. The RKO. What does that stand for? Randall Kenneth Thornton, isn't it? So his, his move is named after himself? Sure. Why not just call it the me? <laughs> I don't know. So, Eric Bischoff was in the ring with a barber's chair. I was very confused as to what this chair was doing. And I think here is where I went back and rewatched the other segment and realized that Bischoff had decided it was time to shave Foley's head mm-hmm. and his beard. I didn't even realize it until here. Verse, actually, before the head shaving, he said that Jared's ass was next. So, apparently, Jared has a hairy ass. Thank you. Then remember, everyone, you're paying for this analysis. Yeah. This this is is this free show? No, this one people. Have this to is pay not for. a free show. Yeah. This is what your money goes to. Thoughts about the hairiness of Jeff Jarrett's ass? Well, he was going to shave Foley's head, Maybe and then he Karen said, Angle on the show and ask her, Jarrett, your ass is next. So, how else would you interpret this? He said next Honestly, week... Honestly, I would try to avoid interpreting this. And would you this. shave your ass, Jeff Jarrett? At least they would have plugged it. His ass? The shave. Let's move on. All right. Look at you. Are you in third grade? I might be. So... They fully came out and they shaved Eric's head. head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Our recap was far more entertaining than the segment. I thought, why is this happening? And then, moreover, I thought, why should I care? Why should I? There's absolutely no reason why you care. <laughs> Shit! That Eric Bischoff got his head shaved. I really think if I if I actually asked Vince Russo why should we care, he would answer, "You shouldn't." <laughs> I firmly believe that. <laughs> A fascinating, fascinating thought. I don't know. I didn't. Regardless, I did not care. We had all the machine guns and... <laughs> Actually, there was a Shannon Moore promo. I was just going to skip that. No, I have two things. First of all, he cut his promo on the book of Dilly Gaff. Then he told us to Google it. Now, I, was now sitting... I want to know... Hold on a second. I just want to know... This is a poll for everybody. When Shannon Moore kept saying this word and kept demanding that you Google it, were you like me and at that point 
absolutely refused. I had I took the time to write down, no, I don't care. Okay, good, I'm not the only no, one. No, when he told us to Google it, I got offended. Then he promised to win the title, which is fine, and then he announced, welcome to Glam Rock. It is 2010. How about welcome to Rockabilly? <laughs> <laughs> welcome to, welcome to Bluegrass. Uh, well, yeah, it's fine. I'm a big fan of that. No, I, I uh, yeah. So, yeah, go on. So that was I can't a, remember what I was going to say. Honestly, it was a whole deal. It, it was something, oh, about the, the tally whack or whatever he wanted us to Google. Mm-hmm. Could he have not, could he at least not have told us to Google the TNA website so we could see what was on the show next week? That would have at least been helpful. Sure. So, we had the machine guns in the ring cutting a promo. Plugging a paper, you everyone. Pay-per-view was after this show, and they took time to plug something on it. I swear to God this is true. He announced, uh, Saban announced that Sunday was the return of Ultimate X, and he said the winners would become the top contenders to the tag team titles, and it would be the beginning of the rise of the machine guns. He said Generation Me didn't deserve a spot in the match, because after all, who had they even beaten? So Generation Me came out and said, well, we beat you. And the machine guns said that was luck. And they... They were in talking trash, and there's a note here that tells you all you need to know about the Impact audience. Shelly said, we are the Xbox to your Atari, and the crowd was horrified. They could not believe that they had used language so rough or, or, or cross or said they used as a personal insult. Then, a few seconds later, they said they had fucked their girlfriends, and the crowd didn't care. Because the crowd has no girlfriends. I can confirm these reactions. And the crowd cannot relate. To that insult. But they know that the Xbox is much cooler than the Atari. Girlfriends over their heads. So. <laughs> <laughs> Profound statement, Vinny. That I was, was letting you just uh, drown. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. So they your own not. Eventually they got in a brawl, and then every other little guy on the roster came out, and it was very casually announced that uh, there would also be a ladder match in the show with four X Division dudes, and the winner of that would be the number one contender to the X title. So that was must, that was what must be on every show. A t- uh, every title must be on the line, and a wacky match must uh, take place where the winner is the number one contender for the next show, I guess. And uh, Borash interviewing Abyss about how he was the uh, special guest enforcer in the main event. And he's a poor man's Hogan promo, and... <laughs> I thought this was actually a great promo, honestly. No, come on. When he, when he announced... Abyss has cut such great promos in the past. I mean, this was fine, but does he have to be a fake Hulk Hogan? We've already got a fake Ric Flair that's not working. I... I, I AJ was, was, was is deliberately trying to be Ric Flair. Abyss is being Abyss, but he's using Hulk Hogan's catchphrases. Mm. When he announced, for the first time in my life, someone is jealous of me, that was a great line. Yeah, that was a good line. He and said he'll win Friday, and then or Friday, he'll win the pay-per-view, and he will take care of Flair if he tries to get involved in the main event tonight. AJ and Jeff with a business enforcer, they had an average match that drew a .76 rating. .74 rating, actually. Well, the, the overrun did go nine minutes, so I, I'll give this a .75. They did the match. They had a ref bump. AJ went to get a chair. Abyss said, no, no. AJ missed a .450. Jeff hit the twist of fate sent on. One, two, three. Yeah. When I saw the ref bump, I assumed, well, okay, Abyss will run in. He will lay AJ out with a choke slam, and then Jeff will get the pin. So it's not the end of the world that Jeff pinned AJ. No, I was mistaken. Jeff Hardy, a man who may be in prison before the next impact tapings, pinned the world champion <laughs> clean, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. It's just like it's it's somebody sarcastically on the board said, well, if Big Show pinned John Cena, shouldn't he be the number one contender? Missing the point that, first off, WrestleMania isn't this coming Sunday. And second off, even if the idea was to set up the guy that beat the number one contender or the whatever, well, first off, that's a bad analogy anyway because John Cena wasn't the champion. But he was the number one contender, but still... Neither Big Show, John Cena, or Batista are going to trial on Wednesday with uh, felony offenses. And, and, and that, that is a very true point. Also true, all of those men are actually wrestling at WrestleMania. Jeff Hardy, prison or no, is not wrestling at Destination X. No. In fact, somebody had some stats. I don't know if they put them on the board. 
But uh, largely every person focused on on this program is not on the paper. Is not in fact on the paper. Hogan's not wrestling the paper. Jarrett's not. Bischoff is not. Foley is not. Jeff uh, Hardy is not. Um, I don't know if the girls are. I don't care. Um, tag guys are. Nation Hall are. So it's not quite a hundred percent. But the, the 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 emphasis is clearly on the men who are not wrestling on the pay per view. It's impact everybody. A I did Care not, I do not. I, a, 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 I did not hate the show watching it, but I did constantly think this is accomplishing nothing. This is just wasting people's time. It's wasting my time. I just, I just, I watched it. I wrote some notes. I moved on with my life. To the back. Vinny's here. We're going to run down the TNA pay per view here very quickly. Considered not having Vinny on and waiting until Tuesday, but I have absolutely no desire to remember this pay per view past tonight. So I want to get this over with. I want to open by saying that this was a bad TNA show, but it was actually probably worse than the review I'm going to give it. And part of that is because I've been reading and hearing a lot from people talking about how this was like some sort of all-time horrible pay-per-view. And I just hear that and I think, have you never watched TNA? I mean, seriously, this is a bad show. It was a bad main event. It was a shitty finish. But, I mean, in the grand scheme of bad TNA programming, this wasn't even in the stratosphere of the worst stuff they've ever put together. There were some bad matches. The main event was bullshit, the finish. But, God, I've seen worse. Yeah, I was reading... There we go. Hey, everyone. I was reading results or, or, or feedback to you and laughing at it, and you would say, oh, come on, it wasn't that bad. And when I think about it, I suppose you're right. This was not the worst TNA pay-per-view they've ever done. There was no... Jenna versus Charmel on this show or anything like that. Mostly I was just hideously bored, and there were sporadic moments of rank stupidity. And I've had many, many pay-per-views where I've been hideously bored. Yeah, this was another one of them. So, was it the worst pay-per-view ever? No. Should you buy it? Fuck no. Absolutely not. I mean, there was that one pay-per-view that I actually tried to get my money back. I didn't feel... I didn't feel so angry watching this show that I wanted my money back. I will say... I was upset that I paid the money for it, yes. but I wasn't, I wasn't compelled to try to get the money back. If, for some reason, you bought this show but have not yet watched it, don't bother. <laughs> well, it's, you it, paid for it. You paid as well. It's sunk cost. You can't get the money back either way. Why? You've already lost your money. Don't lose three hours as well. There was some stuff on the show that was all right, but there was nothing that was really... There was nothing great, that's for sure. The the best, I think the highest rating I gave anything on this show was three stars. Maybe a three and a quarter for the the Ultimate X match. And that may have been slightly generous. That that was definitely the peak, though. But in general, this was a, uh, this was a night of, of uh, not good stuff. And it's funny, I even, I mean, looking back, I gave the main event two and three quarter stars. I mean, the finish was absolutely horrendous. It was a minus five star finish. The match was fine. They had, a, they had a fine wrestling match. They just did a bunch of really, really stupid stuff at the end. Let's look at this thing. Daniels, Red, Kazarian, and Kendrick in a ladder match with the winner getting an X Division title shot. A ladder match opened up the show. They went 100 miles an hour. They did a whole bunch of moves. The fans were very, very quiet early, but then got into it when they started doing some crazier stuff. And uh, basically it came down to one of those deals where we had two guys in the ring, two guys selling outside, then they'd switch places, and finally all four guys were battling on two ladders. Daniels took a backdrop, Kendrick got shoved off, Kazarian climbed up, got the win. There were some good points. There were some points where it was a real mess. Everybody worked hard, I gotta give them that. I gave it three stars, and in hindsight, probably generous. It was probably in the two and three quarter range, maybe two and a half. There was really nothing all that special about this match. I was late, got here in the middle of the match, so uh, all I really saw was a bunch of small men doing a bunch of really stupid stuff. I saw they would do something stupid, the crowd would cheer and go crazy and chant TNA, and then they would immediately shut up again. So they were not really emotionally invested in the match. They didn't care who won or lost. I have no idea why they should have cared who won or lost. All My only lasting memory of this will be what in the fuck was Chris Daniels wearing. This was the most homosexual outfit I've ever seen a wrestler wear. Hmm. It was shocking. Chelsea, who is a generic girl that's been hanging out with Wolfie McGee, wheeled out Ric Flair in a wheelchair, and he did a promo about how he was not a happy camper, using those words. I'm not a happy camper, said Ric Flair. And 
He was talking about how he'd fallen off cages, which I don't recall. Slammed off ladders, which maybe happened in that edge match, but I don't recall. And thrown through tables. And even crashed in an airplane, he said. But through it all, he'd never been in a wheelchair. He said that tonight, Hogan and The Abyss were going to pay the price for what they'd done to him. The whole point of this was, Ric Flair is a crazy old man in a wheelchair cutting promos. is funny and entertaining, and I laugh and I smile. But there's a difference between entertaining and the right thing for business. Ric Flair is a heel. This was almost sad because he was coming out and begging. I mean, there's there's no other way to explain it. He was begging for the people to boo him. Yeah, all right, said, don't woo me. He was begging them to please stop, and they just wooed even louder at everything he said. They didn't take him seriously as a heel at all. They they considered him a, a comedy cartoon, which is what he was in his wheelchair. And if you want to laugh at Ric Flair being wacky, this is great for you. If you if you want Ric Flair as a heel to mean something for business, this is a horrendous, horrendous rule for him. And it doesn't matter. They're not making any money anyway, so who gives a fuck? I don't even know why I even mentioned that. Well, because we had to review this segment, you had to say something about it. It was Ric Flair cutting a crazy promo in a wheelchair. Picture every Rick, crazy Ric Flair promo you ever saw, except, except he's sitting down. That was it. We had Hogan telling Abyss to stop asking him if he was doing all right. He said, of course you are. Use the power of the ring tonight. Abyss giggled, walked off. Oh, Hogan told him, the gold around your finger is going to lead to the gold around your waist. Abyss got new gear to match Hulk Hogan. It's black leather shirt and pants with red and yellow splotches all over it. Mm-hmm. I, it's a thumbs up that they're changing his look to match his new gimmick. The overall picture is a big thumbs down. So then Book Bischoff came in and had a hat on, and he took it off to reveal a buzz cut looking almost identical to what he looked like before his head was shaved. And what's the point? What was the point of shaving the man's head on TV? So it would grow back ten days later. <laughs> it's actually funny because they shaved his head on a taped show, which means his hair grows like an inch in three days. I don't know what the point of it was. He said, listen, Hogan and Hogan said we got to stop the goofiness. We need to stop this crap with Mick Foley. Let's just get back to the task at hand. Making TNA better. Because, of course, everybody, TNA sucks. they got to remind us on every show. So Bischoff I, says, sounds like a great idea. And he left. And then Hogan giggled and said, Eric now had a Hulk Hogan haircut. I guess it was supposed to be a funny line, except, as noted, Eric had hair. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't shave him again, I guess. I laughed. I don't care. The, 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 the <laughs> It's funny that Hulk Hogan is laughing at his own hair. Yeah. That makes me giggle. Sue me. Tara and Daphne knockouts title. The announced, yes, the, the announced up next is a championship match for the knockouts title, and I thought, I know Tara is the champion. Who on earth is she challenging? Daphne. Uh, or, or, yeah, who's challenging her? And the answer is Daphne. I had no clue going into this. And I watched Impact two days ago. Or I guess I forgot. They went to Monday, a week ago. Hmm. But still, I watched Daphne throw, I remember seeing Daphne throw Angelina into the ramp and drop her on her head. Don't recall anything about Tara and a title match being involved. Tara ran in afterwards and attacked her. So that makes it a title match, I guess? Mm-hmm. All right. Daphne Rating, lie. Rating's generous. Half a star. I don't even know why I gave it that. I just... Daphne fucking sucks. Daphne is really bad. She is a- a- atrocious for being... I-, I know we say this every time she wrestles, but she looks like she has... It's her first day in wrestling school when she takes bumps. She f- just drops to her ass and rolls to her back or puts both hands down so she can break both her wrists. It's amazing. And then, after all this hideous wrestling, she busted out a Northern Light suplex. Tara is not much better. Well, that's true. It was a bad match. Daphne's selling was horrendous, as noted. So, no heat for the comeback, except for one guy in the front row that was saying, Boo! And he wasn't even yelling it. He was just saying it loud enough that everyone could hear. We finally got a Let's Go Tara chant going, which led to a dueling chant. That amazes me. Well, it doesn't amaze me because there's no such thing as baby faces or heels in this company. Well, then not, not that part, but someone took it upon themselves to cheer for Daphne. I don't understand. Daphne tried to hit it with the belt, missed. They explained that it had not made contact, and so it was not a DQ. Which I guess means if you bring a gun into the ring and you shoot at someone, but the bullet misses, the match is still going to continue. Because you didn't you didn't effectively use the weapon. No harm, no foul, I guess. I guess. 
So she hit a widow's peak for the pin. I have no idea why they needed to have a missed belt shot in here. And then afterwards, Daphne stole her spider because this feud must this, continue. Of all the feuds on planet Earth, well, there's one that's worse coming up. <laughs> but yes, Daphne, I'd rather this feud continue because the matches will all be one minute and then we'll move on with our lives. I really do not need to see this goddamn Kurt Angle Ken Anderson feud continue. That, that also, yeah. So if you if you tuned in to buy this match, you got a crappy match and no resolution to the feud. So you got nothing. Brutus Magnus did a promo. He will now be known only as Magnus. He faced Rob Terry in a global title match. If someone can explain to me why we need a global title, I will give you $10. Indeed. And no one here is collecting, I can tell you right now. So they had a match. I left the room for like 10 seconds, came back, and the match was almost over. What happened was Terry did a move. He wildly flexed. He did a second move. He wildly flexed. He did a third move, wildly flexed, and then got the pinfall. Went less than a minute. Short, I cannot even say sweet. I don't even know what to say about it. Rob Terry is still the champion. He hit a spine buster-y thing for the pinfall. Yeah, he, people aren't in Rob Terry. He's not very good. And rather than just be big and strong and throw people around, he has to throw these really bad spin kicks in every match, even when they go a minute. Hey, Rob, stop that. It sucks. We had the Motor City Machine Guns versus the Young Bucks Ultimate X match. Winners getting a tag title shot. And by the way, when this pay-per-view was over... This Ultimate X match is now leading to Motor City Machine Guns against Matt Morgan and Hernandez. Way to go. This match was all right. I gave it three and a quarter stars. That may be generous. The X appeared to be lower than ever. It, it appeared that if you, if I would have stood in the middle of the ring and jumped up, I could have touched the X. Now, I wrote the report on the front page, and about... 30 minutes later, somebody in TNA emailed me, and I'll even read the exact email. I won't read who it's from, but I'm going to read the exact email to you because I'm looking for help here from anybody who perhaps records a lot of TNA shows and can get some screen caps. They wrote, the X was not any lower than usual. Maybe your TV got smaller. Mm. I swear to God the X was lower. Somebody please go back and... Uh, and give me some screen caps to prove that, that the cables were significantly lower than they've ever been. And I've read a lot of people that thought the exact same thing. It was not just me. Maybe they moved the hard cam really, really high, and it looked like it was much lower, in case, in, in which case, way to go, production people. Regardless, it did not look very dangerous at all, and they didn't really do anything dangerous anyway. I mean, uh, now that I think about it, there's absolutely no way this, this X was at the same height it's always been. These men were hanging from the X, they let go, and they fell about three feet to the mat. There's absolutely no way this is, the, this is the same height it's always been. So they do a match. So your source in TNA is a liar. I, I cannot possibly know what he's talking about. Maybe they left the X where it was, but they lowered the ring. Maybe I'm thinking maybe, the, the, ring. maybe the X was like five feet tall. I don't know. I just know they were hanging from the cables, and they were like three feet above the mat when they were hanging, which makes the cables about eight feet high. I cannot fathom these cables being higher than eight feet. Remember years ago, AJ was in one of these and took that really retardedly stupid front flip bump yeah, off the cables? Yeah, you're telling me he fell from the same height that this cable was at tonight? The, these men here were all short. Yes. And there'd be one guy hanging from the cables, and his opponent would come up, and his head would be at least as high as their knees. Yeah. They did a good match. I mean, there was really nothing special about it. It was, for, again... A lot of video game style moves. It was, it was four small men taking turns doing cool shit. Yeah. You know, they were, as Doug Williams would later note, acrobats. Yep. You know, and uh, that was it. The Bucks lost. Saban got the X. He's getting a title shot. Really, the only other thing of note is the promo that the guns cut beforehand where they buried the young Bucks, basically calling them Hardy Boys wannabes. And they used the term Hardy Boys, which was baffling to me because it's one thing if you're like, uh, I'm trying to think. You know, it's one thing if you're like, um, you're making fun of The Rock, and you, you, you make fun of The Rock and claim he's, he's like a low-rent Ric Flair. At least you're making fun of The Rock. The Young Bucks are low-rent Hardy Boys. <laughs> when you come on TV and call attention to that fact, that's not a positive. Sure. The, 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 the good part of the promo is when they were calling them children, saying later they would be tucked into the beds by their mother and they would spoon and dry hump their SpongeBob SquarePants blanket. Yeah. I laughed. This this was some good put-downs. And it was preceded by a promo 
I wrote down Angle, which sounds wrong. There was a point here where he talked briefly and then burned a Ken Anderson photo. But whoever was starting this promo said that he admired the men in the Ultimate X match and Hollywood stuntmen would not do some of the things they would attempt. No shit. Hollywood stuntmen are smart. And they do things safely. I would also like to know that they had a pre-show here and they interviewed Dixie Carter and she said that she always pushed hard for Destination X because she was a big fan of the X Division and she liked having the pay-per-view where those guys would get a chance to main event. Still waiting for that chance to main event. Fourth on the card, everyone, is now... This is, this is back like when the uh, when they hired the Kiss Demon. Yes. Kiss Demon in WCW was uh, obviously Kiss. The uh, They had a deal with the band. And part of the deal was that Kiss had to always be in the main event or the semi-main event. So they ended up putting him on the card like third... But they would always announce him as being a main eventer. They would say, here in this co-main event, third on the card, the Kiss Demon. And he'd have a shitty match and they'd move on. What a stupid fucking thing to put in a contract, by the way. Yeah. I realize it was WCW, they did stupid things, but still. The, my next, the next sentence in my notes reads, I will just quote myself. Hall cuts a promo showing off his hairy gut. Mm-hmm. It was Scott Hall and Sean Waltman. Uh... Hall noted he would put on the Tizites again. This is not necessarily a good idea. He is not in the shape he used to be. Who among us is? But uh, Waltman talked for a while, and frankly, I have no idea what he was saying. And then Scott Hall started. He found a lot of ways to say we're going to win and get our contracts. Two notes. First off, Waltman was somehow even less lucid than Scott Hall. I have absolutely no idea how that's possible. Hall, in an example of low standards... Based on how fat he was, he was in good shape here. I realized that, that, that a lot of people were talking about what great shape Hall was in. Seriously. He, he had a fat, hairy gut. His face was spherical. Yes, he was in better shape than he was when he was morbidly obese. That's not saying a whole hell of a lot. He had a match. He doesn't have it anymore. It was Hall and Waltman against Nash and Eric Young. Nash never tagged in. Eric worked the entire match. It was, they were so obviously setting up Nash turning on Eric Young that I presumed it had to be a swerve. And they were not going to have Nash turn on Eric Young. But then Nash did turn on Eric Young, so they swerved me by not having a swerve. Or by having a swerve. However you want to do it. Anyway, Nash turned on Eric, gave him a powerbomb. Uh, Razor gave him the Razor's Edge with great assistance by Sean Waltman. Yes, Scott Hall needed help getting Eric Young up. He gave him the move, and then they pinned him. There was a point where Waltman tried to get a can of spray paint from under the ring. That was the real highlight of the match to me. He could not find it. The ma best match in the show was Sean Waltman versus spray paint. He went for it the first time, and he couldn't find it, and he says, Where the fuck is it? Right into the camera. And Eric Young, who's his opponent, basically starts beckoning to the other side of the ring. So Waltman goes over there, finds the spray paint. They spray paint it right into Eric Young's face and all over the front of his body. The referee, of course, because it's TNA, doesn't see it. Taz, playing the role again of Brian Alvarez, says, and I quote, Doesn't the referee see the paint on Eric Young's face? Of course the ref doesn't. He doesn't see Eric Young green. Eric Young gets pinned, and then... Hall, I'm sorry, Waltman went into the ring to find another can of spray paint, could not find it, and then screams over the effect of, why do they have to hide it? I, I think he said, God damn it, why the fuck you gotta hide it? Yes. Which is a fucking good question. It's already under the ring. <laughs> oh my god. So he finally found it, sprayed an outline around Young's body, they played a cheap wolf pack theme, they danced... That was the end of that. And the, the band was back together, and the fans all cheered. Yeah. They cheered this portrayal of three men beating up one. They're, they're Hero EY, by the way. Yeah. That's, that, that is how much heels and faces mean so little in TNA. How little they mean. I once, this reminds me of a story. I once, in one of the uh, various wacky student films that I did, I had a, a scene where this girl I was dating got really mad at me and went under the bed and got a baseball bat in Student came, film, you say. Came up swinging. Yeah. This sounds like your life. <laughs> it sounds like a, an old relationship, but no, seriously. But so the idea was, you know, in our house, we had a baseball bat under the bed okay. in case someone broke in. Now, she put the baseball bat 
under the bed before we started filming. And so the idea was she was going to get really mad, go under, grab the bat, and come up. I thought, okay, if this were real, which it's supposed to be, it's not supposed to look like we're acting. If this were real, she wouldn't necessarily know right where the baseball bat is. She only knows it's under the bed. So, before we began filming, I moved the bat a little bit. So she got... You're a fool. No, but it it worked because she got really mad. She went under the bed. She had to dig around a bit to find the bat like you'd really do. Well, if you're smart and you have a a weapon for protection, you're going to keep the weapon handy. Well, you keep it... I mean, you just put it under the bed, though. You know what I mean? Well, well, I I don't know what you mean. If if you want a weapon on hand to defend yourself, why would you make it hard to get to? You know, I didn't make it hard to get to. I just made it so she wouldn't immediately just reach under and grab it. I wanted her to have to look for a split second to find it and then grab it. If you're going to keep a weapon under your bed, why do you want to take a split second to find it? Are you are, are you going to say, hold on, Mr. Burger, I'm looking for my bat? No, you're going to want the bat right where you can get it. I don't understand this. Vinny, imagine... Imagine you've got a bed and there's nothing under it. All right. Okay. You put a bat under the bed. Okay. Okay. Now, the bat's been under there for a year. Okay. You have not seen the bat in a year. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. If you're laying on top of the bed, a king-size bed, Mm -hmm. you're going to immediately, without any hesitation, with your eyes closed, be able to grab the bat. It's still the only thing under the bed? Yeah. I... How are you going to know? Are you going to remember you put it at 18 degrees under the right side of the bed? You know what I mean? You have to get off the bed, look under, it. and grab it. Would you not? I, 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 if you see it, you, you said looking around for it. Like, I had this image of someone shuffling boxes around. No, no, I just I just moved it a little bit. So it was not just reach under I, and grab it. I still say most of my paranoid friends who do keep weapons in the bed keep them within sight. If I said, Vince, go grab the Norman Peel book, whatever, off the bookshelf. And you put it there. I see 400 books in that shelf. You'd still have to go and you'd have to look for it. Yeah. If there was one book on the shelf, I would grab it. Okay, well, maybe there's a lot of stuff under the bed. Okay, then then you should put the bat on the outside so it can be grabbed easily. But you still don't know where exactly on the outside it is. Then you're dumb. If you're going to keep... Brian, hang on. Why would you have a weapon if you didn't want... If you wanted... If you didn't know right where it was? The only thing in your house that you should know where it is would be a self-defense weapon, right? It's... Underneath the bed. You know that. Where under the bed, though? Underneath it. I will find my friends who are like, my friends who are children of police and thus grew up super paranoid. They will tell you exactly where the weapons are in their house to the inch. My okay. friends in the military. All okay. right. So you're telling me that if you hit a baseball bat under your bed mm-hmm. and I blindfolded you and I said, grab the belt on the first, grab the belt on the first try without having to look under the bed or anything, just in a blindfold. Roll off the bed and grab it on the first try. You'd be able to do it? If I put the bat there. But even if you put the bat there, you think if I blindfolded you, and on the very first try you could just go into the bed and grab it. I suppose so. It it almost makes me want to put something under that desk right there and have you give it a shot. How about this? How about this? Look at my phone. Okay. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Eyes are closed. Grab it. Exactly. Oh, please! But hold on. The, you you reached. You had to reach a little farther and grab it. I. Right? Did you not? Let's move the fuck on. I want to go home. <laughs> it didn't take two minutes to do it, but it, you, there was there was a brief moment where we had to grab it. The point is, everybody, Waldman hid the spray paint before the match. He should have known where it was. Well, it did not have to be hidden. Yes. And in his defense, I don't think he's the one who hid it. That's the point. Yes. That's how stupid they are. Yes. They actually hid, they not only hid it under one side of the ring where he couldn't find it, but even when he went to the right side of the ring, it was hidden under something. He had to lift something up and reach under to find the spray paint. That is correct. This was stupid. Yes. This was much stupider than my baseball bat story. Where are we? I don't fucking care. A complete waste of time. That, you know what? As angry as I am right now, that conversation was more entertaining than anything on the show. Great! Yes. So, up next, Shannon Moore versus Doug Williams. I'm just going to cut to the finish. Doug Williams hit Shannon Moore in the head with a fucking brick and pinned him. A brick! That's fine with that. So, what's wrong with that? It, I don't... I, 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 Let me give you an example here. If you're going to knock out an opponent, why would you use a, a guitar made of... 
thin wood. Rather than a brick made of compressed clay? If I'm going to hit someone with an object, I want the hardest, most compact object I can find. The heaviest, most massive. What's wrong with a brick? It's just... I mean, I, I realize people have been hit with steel chairs for centuries, well, centuries, hundred, I said it again, a long time in this sport, uh, but just seeing this was so, it was, it was a cartoon. Why not a kitchen sink, you know? They've used it before when Russo was booking. Oh, there you go. So My only problem with the brick was it looked like a piece of a 2 by 4 I'm sorry the brick wasn't red enough for you. <laughs> it should have been red. There, you, you said it was a 2 by 4 when you looked back and checked, and there was a, they had a camera angle, it was extreme close-up, and there was a... Um, Extreme, what's the word? Well, it was shot from one end, so let me get a long two-by-four. Yeah. But, uh, anyway. If you use a brick, get a red one. So then he started cutting this fucking beautiful promo about how Shannon Moore didn't deserve a title shot because he had just walked into the company. True. And uh, he said that Shannon Moore was an example of everything Doug Williams despises about the X Division. They were just acrobats who called themselves wrestlers. He said he is what wrestling should be about. Hold against hold, catch as catch can. He said acrobat, acrobats belong in the circus with the other clowns. Yes. This is an awesome promo sitting in a program I would love to see of Doug Williams, the wrestler, versus the acrobats, except that he hit him with a brick. <laughs> I'm fine with that because he's a heel. Entire that promo. made the promo better because he didn't beat him with wrestling. He had to beat him with a brick. And then he claimed he was a great wrestler and they were all clowns. So there's, there's only one heel on the entire show and it has to be Doug Williams. Great. I I am a huge fan of Doug Williams and and uh, he is great. He was the highlight of this show. I I enjoyed Doug Williams' post match promo burying the stars of the X Division. I enjoyed that a hell of a lot more than, than anything else on this program. And people are going to say, Brian, what a stupid promo! He buried the X Division. No, he was a heel. That was a great heel promo. You're all acrobats and clowns. I'm a catch is catch can grappler. I'm better than you. Great. Let the clowns show him up which is what they're going to do because Doug Williams is a great worker and he will allow the clowns to show him up. And uh, we've got money. <laughs> well, we've got no money, but you know what I mean. Okay, I was, I was incorrect when I said Doug was the only heel in the company. There were three heels in the next match, and unfortunately it was not a six-man. Matt Morgan and Hernandez against Beer Money. The crowd liked Hernandez, hated everyone else, which is the story they're supposed to go with. Uh, every time Hernandez started to run wild, Morgan would... Get in his way, he would go for the dive, and Morgan would step in, and he was scolding him from the ring apron and showing disappointment when Hernandez would get hit. And it got to the point where, in I think my favorite crowd moment of the show, the crowd was chanting, Morgan Boo, Hernandez, yay, over and over again. So, eventually, they got the heat on Hernandez. They then, he then tagged in Morgan, who the crowd hated, and they hated beer money, so Morgan made it come back to absolute silence. Hernandez, Hernandez got back in, finally hit his big dive, and uh, somewhere in here, he hit a Dominator and won. So we have the wacky tag champs who don't get along still. Welcome to 2002. Yeah, and it's actually worse because there are wacky tag champs who can't get along, and the other tag teams are so shitty they can't beat them. And it's going to be two tag partners who hate each other against the Motor City Machine Guns. How is that possibly going to be any good? And two guys who are too big to... Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't see the Motor City Machine Guns laying out a barrage and kick, of kicks on Matt Morgan and having it look good. Kurt Angle versus Ken Anderson, two and three quarter. It was a match. Anderson did some stuff. I'm sorry, Angle did some stuff early. Anderson put him in a series of arm holds. Angle made a comeback. They did some near falls. This was like, when you consider most Kurt Angle pay-per-view matches, this was negative five stars. <laughs> but... Compared to everything else on the rest of the show, it was pretty good. So, finally, Ken went looking for something out of the ring. Of course, he couldn't find that either. Then he got a chair out of the front row, teased using it, but went to use the medals instead. Angle Germaned him, hit him with the medals, cut him open. So, Ken's bleeding all over, which would have been effective had Shannon Moore not bled two matches earlier. Kurt put him in the ankle lock. Anderson tapped. Kurt got his revenge again. And then Anderson... Cuts a promo as Kurt is leaving, saying that Kurt is not a real gold medalist. He is not a real American. He wanted a straight-up match with Kurt, but Kurt had to resort to cheap tactics to get a victory. He said Kurt was going to lay in bed tonight, staring at the ceiling, and the only name that would be going through his head was Anderson. I have absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Kurt Angle beat him, bloodied him, pounded him into a legitimate submission, and now Kurt is going to go home and, and be thinking the name Anderson all night long? Why? I don't care. I must know the answer to this. You, 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 you noted earlier there's a few that we do not need to see anymore, and this is it. 
They've, they've, in one month, I, I have the disdain for this feud as I do for Orton Hunter. I don't ever need to see this match again. They came out here for their blood feud after all we've seen with medals and blood and the fucking United States Army, and they began to exchange holds. Yeah. And headlocks. Kurt said, here, take my head and put me in a headlock. Sure. Anderson did, and then Kurt responded, the Olympic gold medalist, the scariest man on the roster, and the man who hates this Anderson fellow and all he's done, then just pushed him away. Mm-hmm. I could have done that move. They did eventually use the belt to a suplex, but... Then Anderson got the heat, and what followed was a very, very boring five or six minutes. And then there, there was a comeback, and then a ref bump, and then blood, and then angle one, and then there was a stupid promo. AJ did a promo, talking about the main event, Flair's injury. Christy spent the entire thing giggling. That was well, AJ, he, he, I didn't write down the entire line, but he was talking about superheroes, and then he started shouting about how he couldn't remember what made Batman tough. And I thought, you are the world heavyweight champion, about to have a title match, and you were doing wacky comedy. Mm-hmm. This company sucks. Chris got nice boobs, though. And a bit of the promo. Bunch of Hogan impersonations. Talking about how super confident he was because of the major disadvantage AJ was at without Ric Flair. <laughs> Abyss is the heel. <laughs> Which brought us to the match. AJ and Abyss. You would never know AJ is the heel since he proceeded to do a bunch of dives, do a bunch of flips. People are cheering. Flair's going crazy, so the crowd's going, woo! They're clapping as he does all these high spots. I don't know. What is, serious question here. What is Ric Flair teaching AJ? I mean, he really is helping mentor him. What is he teaching him? How to be the worst heel in the entire world? <laughs> I don't get it. How to do promos, I guess. You come out here. How to you, put a robe on. Oh, my God. So, AJ... Let me think of some of the spots here. AJ did a, a Pele kick, and everyone sang the Olay song. He had a springboard clothesline. Everybody popped. He uh, he did a spiral tap. Everybody popped. Then they chanted, that was awesome, in a spiral tap. Abyss hit him with a black hole slam. AJ kicked out, so he can't even be beaten by moves. And then it became complete bullshit, as Flair said, hey, ref, come here. <laughs> Flair's in a wheelchair, by the way. Hey, ref, come here. So the ref comes here, and he proceeds to get sprayed in the eye with something, which takes him quite a while to register. He falls down. Yes, we had Eric Young sprayed with spray paint, and the ref here sprayed with, I guess it was Mace. So he had two men sprayed in the face in the show, and all the none of them was Daniels. So he gets sprayed in the face. Vinny. I thought I was going to go over your head for a second. Vinny gave me the look, waiting for me to, to notice what he had said. It was very funny. Anyway, the the ref gets sprayed in the face. He goes down. Out comes Hulk Hogan with Earl Hebner. He says Hebner's replacing the other ref. He takes uh, Rick. Fla- he takes Ric Flair to the back. Hulk Hogan is pushing Ric Flair in his wheelchair to the back. I just wish that somehow I had a time machine and I could like take this DVD and go back to the year 2000 and just show everyone in wrestling that in 10 years, this is what we would be seeing on pay-per-view. Hulk Hogan pushing Ric Flair around in a wheelchair. That's what we got here, everyone. Mm -hmm. So he goes to push him to the back. AJ proceeds to a springboard 450. Abyss kicks out and begins to Hulk up. I never realized how hard the Hulk up was. (laughs) I thought it was three punches, a finger point, a kick. Apparently, it's very, very difficult. Abyss had a rough time with it. His timing was horrendous. He finally hits the big boot, choke slams AJ, AJ goes through the ring, referee Earl Hebner calls for the bell. Immediately. The champion got choke slammed through the ring and was unable to continue, and so the referee ruled that because he could not continue, he remained a champion! What? I guess... Hogan came out and gave the belt to Abyss. Earl grabbed it, said no, 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 no. Flair came back out. Abyss went to choke slam Flair, but Abyss fell into the hole. He then got out of the hole. Hogan spray painted something into Flair's eyes. Nigel McGuinness ran down. He took a comedy bump, schoolboy backwards over Flair into the hole. Flair then fell into the hole, and somewhere in here... The other guy went into the hole as well. Who am I missing? AJ? AJ. He stayed down there. They all fell. They were all <laughs> they in turned, the hole. Yes, they were all in the hole. They all disappeared. The best part of this to me was Desmond Wolf being ping-ponged back and forth between Abyss and, and Hogan. And they were way over on the side of the ring because there was a giant fucking hole in the middle of the ring. And they were still doing spots. Yes. 
So it ended with the, the heels in the hole, with the belt, I guess, and Abyss and Hogan had their music playing, and they were going up the ramp, and just as I wrote, that show was bullshit, I heard Hogan say, let's get out of here. <laughs> and I thought, I, me too. It's just funny that, yes, that finish sucked. Yes, that was really stupid. But I feel like I see this five times a year out of TNA. This is nothing new. A bad finish on pay-per-view is nothing new. In fact, we used to see it every single month. Where was everybody who's complaining now? Where were you guys three years ago when every Jeff Jarrett match had 8 million ref bumps, a guitar, powder, assorted bullshit, and a finish that made you want to never watch this product again? It just happened all the time. This is just just another one. Nothing has changed. So there were... Unless you really, really like small men doing flips off of ladders and cables, there were no good matches in the show. There was... No. And there were no... Was there a match worth paying money to see? There were no great matches on the show. There were no show. great matches on the show. There were uh, no feuds ended. There were, there were no great promos. There's really nothing to recommend it at all. You, you, you saw... I am, I am past TNA. I'm over it. Yeah. I got over it after the first Monday Night War when I when I when I talked about the gold boat. It'll it'll never be like that again, everybody. I've 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 just I don't have it no more. I can't even get mad. The show sucked and I wasted a Sunday driving up here to watch it. Yeah, but it, it's nothing that's, that's new. Review. It's nothing new though. How many that's Sundays have you though. wasted watching TNA pay per views? How many pay per views have there been? A lot of them. Oh, well, there you go. So it's nothing new, everybody. So anyway, that's uh, it for Vinny. We'll get Dave on the line and uh, we'll see what he had to say about this. I haven't read his review yet. He was busy recapping UFC, which, by the way, was much better than this show. <laughs> UFC created two new stars in one night. Bones, Jones, and uh, Junior Dos Santos. TNA had Hulk Hogan pushing around Ric Flair in a wheelchair. And I'm just trying to think of a time where uh, like a UFC champion could be rendered unable to continue and he would retain the title. That is... It, it is... Who uh, was it? The Randy Couture fight where a guy got his eye, eyelid sliced open? Yeah, it was uh, did Randy. Ha- did the title change on v- that? Yeah, Vitor sliced his eyelid open. Well, there you go. With the the leather of his glove and Couture lost the title. There you go. Yeah. But yes, it's completely absurd. Abyss had a perfectly legal move. It's not his fault their equipment is defective. That's <laughs> true. That's true. This was not so, Abyss's fault. And, and it's a, I guess it's a minor detail, but the referee knew instantly what to do. It didn't occur to him, holy shit, what do I do now? I guess I have to call the match. There was no there was no searching for a bat moment here. He immediately knew, I'm going to ring the fucking bell. And I'm going to say AJ retains. What's the name of the overweight referee that's always working? He was on the show all night looking completely incompetent. I think he was the one that got sprayed in the eyes. What's that guy's name? I only know Hebner and uh, McGee. <laughs> Jamie Tucker. And the, the bald one, Slick Johnson. No, it's uh God. Whoever whoever it is that was refereeing the main event is legitimately one of the worst referees I've ever seen. And I realize that's his role, but he he plays it I don't know if he plays it to such perfection or if he's truly completely incompetent, but and I think it's gotta be a level of incompetence because if you're a good ref, you're never supposed to see any of this bullshit. You're always supposed to be distracted when the illegalities occur. This guy is always looking right at him, and then he puts his arms out to his side and kind of bends his arms a little bit and sticks his neck out and yeah. just stands there. Yes. It, completely impotent. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find his name and, and uh, to think they got rid of Rudy Charles and this, this uh, goofball still around. To the back! I mentioned this briefly in the Daily Update today, and I said if my Danner was still up, I was going to talk about it here on this program. And is, where is your dander now? Oh, way up. It's up? Okay. My my dander is such that I can't buckle my pants around it. That sounds lewd. So on the Tuesday update, I put a link to... It's not really an interview that Vince Russo did. It was actually... There were some... There was, he talked about Paul Heyman, and then there were some quotes from his book. It's from the UK Sun. The interview was linked in the Tuesday news update. I just want to read some of this to everybody. My dander is not up enough to really lose my mind, but I, I do want to I do want to acknowledge this while I'm still in a pretty bad mood. Before I play a song, for example, or talk about Impact and Raw, which really weren't all that bad. 
In the final chapter, Russo tells fans, and this, of course, is Rope Opera, how WCW killed Vince Russo. And that right there, that right there, that title, how WCW killed Vince Russo, yeah. Vince Russo was an innocent bystander in this whole fall. Standards and practices, wrestlers not doing what they were asked to do. How WCW killed Vince Russo. Well, First off, the temerity of this fucker. Well, let's just do this on a sheer factual level. WCW is dead. Vince Russo is not. So something's wrong. Yes. As we've established, he has no, gra- no grasp of reality. So in the final chapter, Russo tells fans, quote, And one last thing, for the record. I called Paul E. personally to ask him to join TNA. He declined. So I guess we're supposed to think that Russo did all he could. All he could to help TNA. Russo also plays, pays glowing tribute to his wife Amy and three children, Will, VJ, and Annie. He writes, I cry when I think of all the sacrifices the family have made for a business that will never give a damn about any of us. A business that will never know any of you personally, but wanted to take you all down at my expense. I apologize for the time I took from each of you while handing it to a locker room full of ungrateful wrestlers who only cared about themselves, with the exception of a few. I can't get that time back, and I know that it was a mistake. To those fans who supported me over the years, thank you. I'm just grateful that at least some of you got it. Oh, yeah. Just go on our board. There's a couple people there that have got it. To the critics, the negativity hurt, and it still does. If that was your intent, bravo. You win. I lose. I hope no other person has to endure the kind of criticism I've had to. What hurt the most of all is that those taking the cheap shots never knew me, never knew what I was about. At the end of the day, I was a man just trying to support his family. Nothing more, nothing less. What a load of bullshit. What a load of complete bullshit that is right there. I read that and got so pissed off. Poor old Vince Russo. He's a victim. He's a victim. The guy, he's just trying to feed his family. How dare guys like me come on the show and talk about how stupid his writing is? How dare we? He's just trying to feed his family. How dare we take cheap shots at Vince Russo? Listen. If anybody can go back, how many shows have we done? How many Brian V shows? Literally, like, 600 of them. Somebody did a, a count the other day, over 600 Brian and Vinny shows or something like that, which I see you immediately hang your head in shame <laughs> on the microphone. We've done over 600 shows. You go back, you find a single time prior to today that I have ever said the names Will, VJ, and Annie. Until this moment... I had no fucking idea what his family's, what his children, what his wife's name was. I've never said a goddamn thing about the guy's family. I've never even said anything negative about Vince Russo as a person. I've said many times. Well, you should call him an idiot. He is an idiot. That's... He's an idiot at his job. Yes. He is a goddamn idiot at his job. What the fuck does that have to do with him as a person? Don't know. I've never said anything like, man, this guy should be killed. I may have. Man, this guy, his family should be taken from him. Don't think I ever said that. Man, what a poor father this guy is. Yeah. You ever heard me say anything like that? I don't give a fuck what Vince Russo does in his, his home life. I may have made jokes like, you know, maybe he tells his kids to get ready for school and then takes them to the dentist to swerve. I may have said shit like that, but it's a joke. It's not even, it's not even a negative thing. Maybe he does do that. I don't know. If it does, does that make him a bad father? No, he's a jokester. I've never said a goddamn negative thing about Vince Russo personally. I've said he's a... I'm sure he's a great guy. Oh, Brian, when you when you take your work as seriously as Vince Russo does, criticizing his work is criticizing him personally. That's his problem, not mine. It's not my problem. I'm devil's advocate, it's not too. my... Now, I will say this. I will say this about Vince Russo's... 
Vince Russo has a flaw as a human being, as we all do, some more than others. Vince Stop Russo, looking at me. Vince Russo has the flaw that he can't take responsibility for anything in his work. Maybe he takes responsibility for shit he does at home. I don't know. I don't give a fuck what he does in his home life. But my God, have you ever heard an interview with Vince Russo asking about mistakes he has made? In fact, I have. Vince He's, Russo... Well, I've, I've heard him... I've heard interviewers try to ask him about that, but they have made a fatal flaw for he has never made mistakes. It, well, no, it's not even that. It's An interview with Vince Russo is completely useless. Because you will ask him why he did a certain thing, and he'll say, bro, I know. And he'll go, yeah, you know, you're right, this and that, but this happened, and this happened, and I ended up having to do this, and the talent wouldn't do this, and standards and fucking practices, and blah, 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 blah. It's always somebody else's fault. Vince Russo's flaw is that he can't accept the fact that he doesn't know what he's doing in his job. That is a massive flaw. Listen, if I ran a business and clearly I was doing everything wrong, you'd think I'd, I'd have to make some changes. I mean, if our subscription numbers were badly plummeting, let's say that I, I brought uh, let's say that I brought you on board in 2006, as part of the, 2005, as part of the Brian and Vinny show. Let's say we had 100 subscribers, yeah. and I brought you on board, and the next day 10 people quit. Well, to be fair, that is what we both expected to happen. And then we did another show, and 10 more people quit. And next thing you know, I've got 10 subscribers. Mm-hmm. I go, huh, something ain't working here. Let's get rid of this fucker. Right. You'd be history. Because you see what's working and what's not working, and you do something about it. Vince Russo has an inability to do that. Vince Russo in that situation would have given me a raise. He would have. Yes. He would have given you the show. Sure. He would have taken him off the show and just given you the show to run solo, and then he'd be baffled why it wasn't working. He'd, he'd blame our server, the server company... He'd blame Google, China. He'd find somebody to put the blame on other than you. Same thing with Vince Russo. The guy has absolutely no idea what he's doing. He doesn't learn. He never learns from wrestling history. He never learns from what's right and wrong. But this all has to do with his job. Nobody ever takes cheap shots at Vince Russo. What's a cheap shot? Pointing out that his bullshit lines about bringing up ratings and all this crap, by bringing up the numbers and pointing out that he's wrong, that's taking a cheap shot? No! That is pointing out truth. I never come on here and lie. I never come on here and say, man, last pay-per-view Vince Russo book did a thousand buys. Never. I... I honestly tell you what I really believe and what I know about TNA business and Vince Russo's effect on it. And all of these numbers, I mean, all of the ratings and everything like that, you can look all that shit up. Buy rates are a little bit harder, but the ratings, you can go look all that shit up. You can go through his book. He's got all this bullshit about how he went to WCW and the ratings went sky high and all this stuff. Death of WCW has all the numbers, and if you don't believe him in that book, you can go back and look online or look in the observers or look wherever, and you can back up all those numbers. They're all real numbers. I just got so pissed off reading this, hearing this guy cry and bitch and just moan about, oh, everybody takes cheap shots at me, everybody's so mean to Vince Russo, they don't know what kind of guy I am. It doesn't fucking matter what kind of guy you are. Look at Vince McMahon. The a, shit that guy's done in his life. He's a dick. Does it fucking matter what kind of person he is? No. We never talk about that. I mean, we may bring up things like, man. He does own a yacht called the Sexy Bitch. <laughs> yeah, but what the fuck does that have to do with whether WrestleMania is going to do a million buys? Well, nothing. I'm here talking about the business. I don't give a fuck what Vince McMahon is doing on his private time unless it adversely affects his business. What a crybaby. It was very What windy. a melodramatic crybaby. And it is amazing that, it, it, you know, the, the business was so cruel and took all the time away from his family, and it caused him to get the attention of the... So quit! Yes. The, the cruel, heartbreaking critics, and it broke his heart so much, he stayed in the industry for another decade. He's still there now! He's, yes. Decade can counting. I mean, if you, want to, if, if you want me to take cheap shots at him as a person, I could ask the question, well, if this is so hard on your fucking family... Why the fuck are you still doing this job? Answer that for me. 
I, I, honestly, man, I got a family and they're miserable. I never devote enough time to them. They hate this business. I hate this business. But God damn it, I'm going to keep doing it. Why would you do that? I don't know. Just melodramatic bullshit. Piss me off. So there you go. And Here's my thoughts on Vince Russo's crying, pandering, pathetic attempt at getting sympathy here in his fucking book. Just disgust me. We have to talk a lot more about it, really, because... I don't want to. Y- oh, you have something to say? Go for oh, it. You, you mentioned on the show like a month ago. It would be in your best interest for Vince Russo to succeed. Yeah. And it always has been. Now, why would I want Vince Russo to fail? <laughs> why would I want anybody in this business to fail? It would be best if everybody succeeded. Yes. It would be best if everybody made money. And I'd make money. Everybody would be happy. Sure. Fans would be happy. I mean, hey, think about this. Think about this. I realize that people love the impact when we rant and rave about impact. But you realize that we we do have a fair number of people that every now and then they'll go on the forum and say, man, I'm bored of of the same old reviews. I'm, I'm I'm bored of the same old stuff. Right. Like it's our fault that the stuff we're reviewing is the same old shit. At least it's changed a little bit. But if you look back eight, nine months, there was a period where everything was extraordinarily stagnant. People seem to have forgotten that because WWE has been so great building up WrestleMania. But you go back like nine months, this fucking company, the same guys in the main event on every show having the same matches. It was the same boring program every week. And we had to review it, which in turn was boring because we're repeating the same stuff we repeat every week about the same guys, and people got on us about it. Right. That actually always pissed me off. It's my fault that Randy Orton and John Cena are having their ninth consecutive match. Yes. How in God's name is that my fault? I want that to change more than anybody. So, again, if, if wrestling is successful, the fans are happy, I'm happy, I make a little bit of money, the fans get to hear something different on the radio shows. More wrestlers have jobs. More wrestlers have jobs. Everybody benefits. Why would I want to skewer anybody? Now, I'm happy skewing Vince Russo because for eight fucking years, it's been the same failure. Never learning from any mistakes. Just the same failures one right after the other. Time to get rid of the guy. Time to hang that guy out to dry. Now, when we get into the impact report here tonight, I realize that... I yesterday and and uh, even today looking back, I it was a better show. Yes, this was a much better show. It, it, it is ironic. This Russo Rand is coming on a, a, a vastly improved impact. But even go back in history, and there have been good impacts. It's not like every impact in the history of the world was bad, this except not, Monday night. This is not the first good impact ever. No, no, this was a good impact. This impact was greatly improved over the week prior. Thumbs up to this impact. Now, if you go back through the archives, there are many impacts that we gave thumbs up or two thumbs up to. Ultimately, it always goes back to the same old shit. Maybe this time it'll be different. We'll give the guy the benefit of the doubt. But when you look at the spoilers for next week, they do not look promising. Why do you do that? (laughs) Uh, People bring it to my attention. I see. The spoilers for next week don't look promising. Now, we'll wait and see. Maybe next week's show is going to be great. On paper, it does not look promising. We shall see. So, with all that said, we're going to review this impact here today. We're going to hope that things have improved. Maybe Vince Russo, after all these years, finally figured it out. That Crash TV doesn't work in 2010. And now there's going to be a change. We're going to go back to some more logical booking. We'll build up some fucking pay-per-views. it will be long-term planning. Actually try to make some money. Uh, not in long-term planning. I don't... See... Vince Russo used to do long-term planning. Mm. But long-term planning only works when you've got a clue. If you don't have a clue about wrestling, long-term planning means jack shit. Because you're building up to stupid shit. Right. It's still stupid shit whether you build up to it over the course of a week or six months. It's still bad shit. I just want good shit. I don't care if, I don't care if you book week to week. I don't care if you, if you book backwards eight months. I just want good shit. This impact was good, so we're going to talk about it here, and we'll see what happens next week. So, I've wasted a lot of time here ranting, so let's start on impact. You go ahead and start. 
Well, as we sit here talking about how this is a good impact and how happy we're with it, it started off on a dour note. Eric Bischoff was in the ring allegedly playing guitar. It was uh, <laughs> very obviously not Eric Bischoff playing guitar. They would show a man's fingers playing and then show Eric closing his eyes and rocking his head back as he was feeling the groove. You never actually saw Eric Bischoff playing guitar. It was a work. It was a work concert. You know, it's funny. I almost believe it was real. I realize that we never actually saw a shot of mm-hmm. Eric Bischoff like his whole body playing the guitar. Mm-hmm. We only saw close-ups of his hands without a face, and we only saw close-ups of a face without a hand. And I, too, assume this had to have been bullshit. But However, it was possible. This was a live show. Yes. And the fingers playing the guitar were on cue. And I just find it a little hard to believe that TNA didn't fuck this up. It, it, it is possible that Eric Bischoff is, in fact, a very talented musician, in which case it's the crack technical team's fault for shooting this in such a way as to make me think it was fake. Yes. Regardless. Re- whether it was fake or not, that was the impression I got watching this live. That I got the impression I was being fed a load of bull. And, yep. and not even the uh, typical bullshit they associate with wrestling, because I'm supposed to take this seriously. So anyway, he plays a fucking concert. This went on forever. Eric Bischoff, alone in a spotlight, playing his guitar... Then he explained that people there were a lot of things people didn't know about him, such as that he was a classically trained musician. And then he explained that is why he hates Jeff Jarrett. Because Jeff Jarrett takes guitars and bonks people with them. Because he's a phony. Because he's a phony. So he challenged Jeff to come out and play. This is the best explanation they can have for why Bischoff has been fucking with Jarrett for a few months. So Jarrett came out. Couldn't play, couldn't sing, couldn't dance. I would love to see him dance, actually. Bischoff called him a phony, said I don't want to... F- I, for some reason, he doesn't want to fire him. I don't. Uh, still, I couldn't figure this out I either. still don't understand why. He challenged Jeff to hit him with a guitar, and Jeff teased it and teased it and teased it, and then finally thought better of it and refused, and this disappointed Eric. So he started calling Jeff a coward and whatnot, Started uh, saying, this is what your daughters are going to think of you. Taking cheap shots at his family, in fact. And uh, so Jarrett returned, and Bischoff had his back turned, was ranting about whatever, and he turned around, and Jarrett mocked him with a guitar. And this was the best prop guitar ever, because it made a very loud noise to the point where I, I was actually concerned for Bischoff's safety until they showed a million replays, and you see his head does not move, the guitar shatters all around him, and then he sells, and he's fine, but... I was terrified of this, this impact, and uh, then and that was that. So Eric got what he wanted, Jeff hit him with a guitar. Jeff went backstage, Mick Foley was there saying, boy, I bet that felt good. They hugged. They went to commercial, and they came back, and uh, Jeff was still in the ring. Oh, excuse me, Eric was still in the ring. He got to his feet and started talking, and he was angry but unhurt from this crippling guitar shot. So that, that, that's the devastating it was. It... Knocked him cold for five minutes, and he was just magically better. So even though Jeff had done what Eric wanted him to do, and even though Eric hates Jeff, he still refused to fire him, saying instead he would book Jarrett versus Foley with the winner getting fired in about an hour. Or excuse me, the loser getting fired, or the winner, however you look at it. With the loser being fired in about an hour, and uh, then he said the winner will be my bitch. And they cut backstage, Foley and Jeff were watching on a monitor, Mick Foley said, that was a short-lived celebration. And it went back and forth for a while, and finally Foley says, this is a fight neither one of us can win. And he stormed off. This was the most sitcomish moment in their history. I, this, this segment needed a laugh track all the way through. And I didn't mention these things yesterday, but I did have some, some nitpicking with this segment when, I, when you read it back here again. A couple of things. First off, the whole... The whole why won't Eric Bischoff just fire Jeff Jarrett is a question that needs to be answered. Why doesn't he just fire the guy? I have no fucking idea. Because, all right, let's 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 do an analogy with me and you. Let's say that I want to fire you. <laughs> Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Now, I'm in charge. That's true. I do not have to answer to anybody. 
Mm-hmm. I can just fire you. Right. So if I have that power and I don't need an excuse and I want to fire you, why would I beg you to hit me <laughs> so then I can fire you? You know what I mean? Well, I don't know. Why why wouldn't I just fire you? Why would I why would I willingly accept being punched in the face to fire you when I could just fire you? That baffled me. And the second thing, and the people popped big for Jared afterwards, so it's not a big deal, but there was just something about Eric Bischoff supposedly playing the guitar masterfully. He calls out Jeff Jarrett, whose whose gimmick I guess is I don't know what his gimmick is. But he brings a guitar with him, and he's from Nashville. You call out Jeff Jarrett, the baby face. You dare him to play the guitar or sing or dance, and he does none of it. You really did make the guy look like a coward. Yeah. (laughs) You really did expose him as a phony. And then he did tease him with the guitar and refused to do it basically until Eric had his back turned. Yeah. Yeah. So, I... Yes... The segment, uh, I give the segment a thumbs in the middle. It was fine. It set up shit for later on in the show. But as usual, there were things in the in the segment that made no sense. I thought because there always will be with Vince Russo I, working. I, I, there. I cannot say I cannot give this a thumbs in the middle. I thought it was a thumbs down. It, All right. It, and we'll talk about the stupidity of this, but it led to a loser leaves town match with an hour's build that accomplished nothing. Well, that was stupid. And uh, you can't win them all. Yeah. Uh, frankly, I, I saw nothing positive in this segment. Really, I guess Bischoff's promo. He's, he is a good performer. But it did nothing. It literally did nothing for me. Speaking of doing nothing for me, beautiful people and Daphne versus Tara and Angelina and Taylor and Sarita. They plugged during this match nationally several times throughout the show that this would be the only chance you have to watch Impact this week. Mm-hmm. There would be no Thursday replay. I thought about this. So there's basically basically the, the, what they're thinking is that there's two sets of Impact fans: those who watch Monday. And those who watch Thursday. So they're telling this message to the people who, who are watching on Monday, you won't be able to watch this show for a second time on Thursday. So they probably thought, great. And then you're telling the people, I guess who usually watch it Thursday, you're screwed. Only it's Monday, so they're not watching anyway. Yeah. So I don't see what this accomplished at all. I liked how last week all the guys went on Twitter, including Dixie Carter and we're begging people to DVR the show. On Thursday? No, on Monday. Oh, on Monday. Do Why you... would you do that? <laughs> Shouldn't you tell them to DVR Raw? I would think so. So they had this match. I It was what it was. Uh, there was a, the, this, the heat was supposed to be Tara running the ropes, and Daphne would grab her hair, only I think Daphne forgot. And so time froze with Tara just hanging on the ropes, and Daphne finally hit her. Mike today plugged an upcoming UFC show, and just hearing that he, him plug that show on Impact was so bizarre. What's bizarre is they they were airing two of the prelims from the UFC on Versus show, and they plugged that episode of Unleashed harder than they have plugged any of their own shows or pay-per-views probably in history. That is probably true. Fascinating. That is probably true. So... Uh, they went with the finish with the the, the finish with the uh, parade of finishers where every girl hits a big move, does a pose, and then turns around to someone else to clobber her. And it ended with Daphne cutting off Tara and pinning her with a wacky spinning move. And by the end, the crowd was into this, uh, and, and so I, I cannot call this a failure, but it was not particularly good. No. AJ and Flair arrived. They are the two stooges. They were in car- cartoonish wheelchair and casts and uh, bandages and sniping at each other, so we would laugh at them. 30 minutes from the show, we got a pay-per-view recap, which I guess, hey, if, if you think there are people who are tuning in, because you assume your audience did not buy the pay-per-view, so you want to use the pay-per-view recap as a tease or a draw, bury it in the middle of the show, make them watch the first half hour anyway, so I guess I get that. Abyss and Hogan came out. Hogan said Bischoff was right that Flair can hit his Hogan's buttons. He vowed to the fans and Dixie that he could get the company back on trap and it was back on track, and it was only business starting at lockdown. I love. I just love the constant references to we're here to get Impact back on track because God knows it's so off track. Well, it's fans. <laughs> it We've done such a bad job. Now we need to fix it. It would be one thing if he this was his first show. But he has now been there for two and a half months. Or maybe if, like, maybe if there was some sort of great storyline that 
push the company supposedly off track. You know, you bring in a GM who runs roughshod or something like that. No. The, it the, just sucks. It, TNA sucks, so they need to fix it. That's what they're telling their audience every time they do yeah. this. So he had a big announcement they were teasing, and the big announcement was that Abyss was going to be team captain of Team Hogan at Lethal Lockdown. So he gave the mic to Abyss, who cut this awesome promo about how he did not win the title the night before, but he won his own respect. And he talked about feeling the power of the ring and putting through, putting AJ through whatever part of the set he fit, he, whatever part of the set he saw fit. So he was he, awesome here. I did like, by the way, I just realized this. I don't think there was any period during the show where Hulk Hogan explained why he had handed the title to Abyss, but Earl Hebner gave no. it back to AJ. No, never addressed. And and why Hogan didn't just put the belt on AJ or something. Or on Abyss. I don't know. No, there, there was no explanation. You would have of, liked some sort of explanation. There was no explanation of what did happen, nor what should have happened, nor what people wanted to happen. It was just left. So, AJ and Flair came out. Flair said that he was the pissed off one. He said St. Louis was Flair country and that he is a cage match specialist. And that terrified me because I thought that meant Flair would be wrestling in the match. Which I guess he still might be. But he announced that his captain would be Sting. Uh, the lights went out. You know, we went to <laughs> we went to that SmackDown taping two weeks ago. And uh, The Undertaker did a lights out appearance. And we talked about how I didn't notice them sneaking Undertaker down under the ring. But what we didn't talk about was how the lights went out. They were out for maybe four seconds. And when they came back on, Taker had already scrambled up into the ring and struck a pose. Yep. And he's a pro. He's been doing this for a long time, and he knows how to do it. But I, I, even there live, knowing what had happened, I was still impressed with just how fast it all came together. These lights were off for a long time. <laughs> and to be fair, they did. A, there was more than just one guy climbing in the ring. When the lights came back on, AJ was in the ring, Sting was in the ring, and Hulk Hogan had magically been handcuffed to the ropes. Mm-hmm. So... AJ laid out Abyss with his crutch. Sting just left. Mm-hmm. I guess he was there to be the electrician, to take care of the lighting. So uh, AJ's taking out Abyss, working him over. Crowd stands for RVD. They get the Pope. He came out, ran wild on AJ in a fine display. The baby pieces all beat him up, and then the Pope saved Hulk Hogan. I don't know if this means anything, but it's still just funny to say and think about. The Pope saved Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So. Uh, There's nothing <laughs> wrong with this segment. It, well, I, I, you know what it was? It should have been stretched out over several shows. Yeah. I, I, it drives it, me crazy when you, you do an angle and heels do something dastardly to the baby faces. But then in the exact same segment, the baby faces just make their own comeback, and send the heels packing, which begs the question, well, why did the heels do anything in the first place? We have been, it, we have been talking about how Edge and Jericho are, are, have been continuously in their feud, right back where they were a week ago or two weeks ago. Yeah. This is, they're right back where they were five minutes ago. Yeah. So. Why couldn't the, it should have been Hogan gets handcuffed, they beat the shit out of the baby faces, that's it. That's it. Next week, maybe the baby faces get their revenge, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe the heels keep beating them up until it's time for you to pay to see the baby faces get their revenge at the fucking pay-per-view. Yeah. I realize that's asking too much in 2010. Uh, Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam showed up and their little buddy Shannon Moore. They said they were there to have fun at somebody else's expense and to show off Jeff's new shirt. Well, they are there to have fun at someone else's expense. That is undoubtedly true. That is the truest statement I've ever heard on Impact. <laughs> we are here to have fun at someone else's expense. Yes. True. True. Oh, Big Rob Terry squashed Tomko. Nothing else Tomko, to say. who got a title shot, mind you. He got a shot at the global championship. Sure. And why not? Uh, why, uh, what are the qualifications now? Give it to anyone. Who cares? Who's got the largest gut on the roster? You're getting a title shot tonight. Scott Tom Hall. Tomko! Yeah. So, no, they, Tomko's fatter than Scott Hall. He probably is. So we had a recap of Mick Foley shaving Eric. There was a Mick Foley, Jeff Jarrett highlight video that I, uh, you know, I skipped through commercials and I saw, wait, there's a video package to go back and watch this. And I watched about 10 seconds and realized, wait, I don't care. So I skipped ahead again. Foley and Jarrett were doing a promo. Foley said that he had been thinking of driving Eric Bischoff out of TNA. 
And Jared said they both deserve to stay there. And Foley said they owed it to each other to show how much the company meant to them by driving one of them out somehow. I don't know. The point of all this, when it all ended, they were hunky-dory and at peace with the fact that the loser of their match was going to be fired. And they agreed to go out and have a good competitive sportsmanship, you know, an athletic contest with a loser being fired. And they didn't care. Yeah. There was no, I will do anything to keep my job. There was no, I love Jeff, but if I have to kill him, I will. No. They were just, you know, loser goes home. And I, I just said, if, if, if they don't care, why should I? Well, maybe the storyline is this is realism, and they both know that the loser is going to be back in three weeks anyway. That, well, that's the other thing. <laughs> There's that possibility, too. So we had Jarrett versus Foley. Beer money as referees. For, yeah. And well, why not, I often ask. And why not? I mean, wh- why not is the key question, Impact. But I know the answer would be, well, it plays into the storyline. In what way, though? I don't know, but they, it does. They hate both guys. <laughs> they interfered one time for the guy who ended up winning anyway. Because playing into the storyline means something similar has happened in recent weeks. Like, for whatever reason, Beer Money was like a referee, or... Wait, what was it? It was... Jarrett was a referee for Beer Money versus Foley... There's no explanation for how beer money plays in any of this, but no. it's part of the story, you see. That's why it supposedly makes sense, Honestly, even I, though it I don't doesn't. see it, but okay. But that's the point. Well, the point here is, the highlight of this match was the sign of the crowd reading, Where is Samoa Joe? A great question. He has been disappeared. If I did not work for this site, if I did not read The Observer and, and your newsletter, I would assume that in real life, Samoa Joe had been fired. He has disappeared. Yes. He was kidnapped. They mentioned it for two or three weeks. Now he's gone from the program in every way. So they wrestled for a long time. I couldn't get into it because, like I said, because the guys didn't seem to care about being fired and because I assume both will be back within a month. But uh, Jarrett won. The crowd was so heartbroken and distraught and upset at Mick Foley being fired they sang the goodbye song. Our beloved cuddly Mick Foley's gone. So Foley and Jarrett had a heartfelt... Actually, well. I loved I loved the finish. I want to talk about the finish here very quickly. Fair, go ahead, have it. So, Foley hits a double arm DDT onto a chair. Jared puts his foot on the ropes. Foley produces the sock, which Mike today referred to as Mister Socko. I didn't think they could say that, but apparently they can. So, Foley gives him the Socko claw. Jared reaches for the ropes. Robert Roode kicks his hand off. I thought, this must be the finish. Foley then puts him in a body scissors with the Socko Claw. There is seemingly no escape for Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett then proceeds to elbow his way free, give Foley one boot in the corner, and then give him a stroke onto a chair for the pin. A complete burial of McFoley. Yes. He, he took his finisher... He took his finisher with a body scissors. He no-sold his finisher. He fought his way out of his finisher. And then literally 10 seconds later, he hit his own finisher on the guy and pinned him. Yes. And uh, Wow. Yeah. Who put this match together? Vince. Jeff, apparently. Jeff, Jarrett, and Mick Foley. This was the best finish these two fucking guys could come up with? No one cares. No, that is the key. No one cares. These guys don't and care. And I, I ask again, you know, if Robert Roode was so, you know, if he wanted Jeff Jarrett to lose, he kicked his hand off the ropes, why didn't Beer Money just beat him up and let Mick pin him? Don't know. Why not? So, why didn't he just rule, double DQ, you're both, both fired. That's actually a great question. Uh, we, we can at least accept the possibility that perhaps... I long, was I long since gave up on this heel ref bullshit. Yes, so... Then Eric Bischoff decided that even though Mick Foley was fired, he was not satisfied. He ordered Beer Money to attack Jarrett. They did so with gusto. And then came, I think, my favorite moment in the entire show. They started playing Jeff Hardy's music. And Bischoff was so clueless, he started shucking and jiving to it. Yeah. Bischoff was doing commentary for the whole thing. He was, he was, and they, they cut to him, and he's smiling, and his shoulders are bobbing. And the next thing you know, Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam are in the ring whipping ass, and he's outraged. Yeah. That was funny for several reasons. So... So they clear the ring, RVD cut a promo, he wanted to know which was beer and which was money, at which point James Storm clarified by pointing at himself and screaming, I'm beer! Which was my second favorite moment of the show. 
Long story short, he challenged them to a match and they accepted. So RVD has been demoted. At the time, I rode further demoted from Hogan's little buddy to just little buddy. Although by the end of the show, that was irrelevant. So never mind. I like how this show told the story that Eric Bischoff has all this power. He signed a Flair or a Foley Jarrett match where the loser has to leave TNA forever. All this stuff. And anyway, Jeff and RVD come out and he acts completely helpless. My God, what's happening? Yeah. Who okayed this? Yes. How dare this happen? Well, yeah, this, you cannot this, just stand up and say, no, this match will not take place. Security, get these two dipshits out of the building. This has been a TNA thing for years. There are always multiple people in charge, and they can always pull rank on each other for whatever is convenient, for whatever story they want to tell at that moment. Sure. So that's this is just more of the same. So if only say goodbye to everyone backstage, the... Uh, the knockouts came up to say hi, and he warned them, don't hug me, my wife's watching. Then Bubba the Love Sponge was there to interview him. Comedy as he leaves. Yeah, well, to be honest, that's how Foley would say if he was actually being fired. I was fine with that. Bubba the Love Sponge asked him for a word. Foley said this was not the time, and even if it was the time, there's a lot of men I would rather talk to before you. So Bubba said, well, get lost, old timer, don't let the door hit you on the way out. And so Foley turned around and grinded by the collar and shouted at him for a bit and then punched him right in the damn face. Yeah. That looked like it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> I marked out for this harder than I did for any punch on the UFC show. This this was a louder reaction for me than John Bone Jones breaking that dude's face. He hit him hard. So that was that. <laughs> the, 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 it was funny because as soon as Bubba appeared, despite these signs you see in the crowd, most of them hate Bubba. Yeah. So as soon as he appeared, massive boos, and then when Foley socked him, huge ovation. Yeah. He, he may be the best heel in the company. Bischoff met with Hulk. Hulk was a little upset. Said Foley could have been an asset. I was gone. He uh, <laughs> he said he understands how things can get personal, just like he got tied up with Sting when that was in the past. I saw Sting put you in handcuffs an hour ago. Yeah, it's not really in the past. Well, it is. I, I guess it's an hour ago. It's the very recent past. And then he asked Jeff to, or asked Eric to please leave Jarrett alone because, and I quote, Jarrett's getting over with the fans. Yeah, but Foley apparently was not. I guess not. So that was that. Uh, I just like how he he uh, he's like, we could have done something with that guy, but now he's gone. And then he just moved on. <laughs> <laughs> it was not like he, he was concerned for a moment, but then was like, ah, who gets life it? goes on. Life goes on. Got to face the future. Christie interviewed Beer Money. They they cut a good promo, basically saying that they had realized it was time to put themselves first and they were going to win the main event. Boras interviewed RVD and Hardy, and they basically said they two were going to win the main event. Not much to it. Morgan versus Hernandez. Matt Morgan. Or excuse me, Hernandez beat the fuck out of Matt Morgan for a while. Just destroyed this giant man. Crowd was totally into it. And then Morgan cut him off and immediately placed his head against the ring post and hit the carbon footprint into the post. They played this off like a giant injury angle. Uh, to the Brain point. trauma, Taz said. Taz, 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 Lovely. Taz was just the possibility of brain trauma. Morgan hit this footprint and Hernandez tumbled tumble to the floor, not moving. And Morgan rolled into the ring and then whispered to the ref, like, I think I killed him. And the ref went outside and held up the big X. And uh, they came down and they took care of him. And they had, they had, as they noted, his best friend Homicide there. Not noting the last time we saw these men on TV, they were trying to kill each other. Bitter blood feud. Bitter, bitter blood feud. So it, it was... I saw this idea of, let's try to make this one look real. Well, what about the rest of the shit on the show? Yeah. That's want, all fake? We want, to tell the, we want to tell the crowd, and this is another classic Vince Russo move, everything else you've seen on the show is fake, but this is real. Sure. So, Which is funny, because still no one believed it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, they did not get the goodbye song, at least. But they, they, it, it, it was a big deal. They uh, w- went through many segments of just tanning to him and carting him back to the backstage, getting him on an ambulance, and Hogan said, telling someone to call his wife, because she was not watching. It's good say. She had the DVR on. So, it was the, the I, n- no one believed it anyway, and I don't know if, I, I don't know if you, you could really make them believe it, but if, if anything... And this is going to sound perhaps retarded. If anything, they did too good a job of faking it. Because from, from Morgan whispering to the ref, I just killed him, to the ref running out and turning right to the camera, holding up the big X sign, everything just came off 
too perfectly realistic. Yeah. So, but the, the, it was not terrible. I mean, they, they, they established that, you know, they're still tag champs, and Morgan has taken Hernandez out. Hernandez will be out for who knows how long, and then we'll come back and get revenge. And this is a simple story that's been told a million times in wrestling. It usually works great. So, huzzah. Uh, oh, the, the other, this is also a nitpick. They're, they they cut to the announcers for the... Uh, you know, the, 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 the wrap-up, I guess, the injury angle, and, and the segue back to more wrestling. And Taz was flustered, didn't know what to say. He uttered his unfortunate line about brain trauma. But Ta- Taz was actually believable. And then Mike Tanay started to speak, and it's really not his fault, but everything Mike Tanay says sounds like a sales pitch. He's just It's just the way he is and the way he talks. He is a Vegas showman. So as soon as, as everything he sounds, I, I, whatever he says, it sounds like a giant shill. So we got a. So what do you say? Oh, just that. Uh, Back to action. Essentially, yes. So and we're very concerned about the head injury of Hernandez. Back to action. Got a video recap of the band getting back together. Beer Money versus Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy. This match ruled. This is my favorite TV match in a long time on any show. At least as far back as that Rey Mysterio Luke Gallows match, the first one for about a month ago. Uh, heat on Jeff for a long time. Jeff is an awesome face in peril. Hot tag to Rob Van Dam. Rob Van Dam makes an awesome comeback. The uh, did a bunch of stuff at the finish, and then the finish was both baby faces, faces hitting all their cool moves. The senton and the frog five star frog splash for the pin. Baby faces won. This was just great. I loved this match. Caught you off guard there, didn't I? <laughs> I thought you'd keep going. Yes, it was a great match. Yes. Yes. So they also. The, the other remarkable thing that happened here, they plugged matches for next week. Yeah, they did. The first, during the match, they plugged Tara versus Daphne, first blood. Now, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about that first. Can we talk about that first? This is a match no one on earth could possibly want to see. Two bad wrestlers who have had many bad matches, now they're going to make us, I, I guess they were supposed to be excited by the possibility of watching a woman bleed. No, thank you. But I didn't even care. I didn't care that I have zero desire to see this match. I was so happy they were just plugging anything for next week that I, I just cheered. I threw my arms in, the air, arms in the air and I cheered. So the match finally ends, and uh, RVD and Jeff are celebrating. Eric Young hits the ring and basically announces that next week it will be himself, RVD, and Jeff versus Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Sean Waltman, which I have... Hardly any more desire to see, although it at least has bigger stars. But, hey, they're promoting next week. Woohoo! Yes. It's an episodic feel to this. Eric Young, one man does not fit in this match. Eric he, Young is just not doing it for me lately. He is certainly the low man on the totem pole there. I was a huge fan of Eric Young for a long time until they killed him. They have killed him deeply. All that dead. super Eric bullshit, and so, then all of a sudden he's a he's a then he's the world man. elite geek, and then he's Kevin Nash's little buddy, and then he got punked out there, and we're yeah, we're now supposed to buy him as he's wearing a leather jacket all the time. He buzzed his head. Yeah, wasn't he wasn't he hated a while ago? Didn't he hate America? Yes, and was a, an evil dastardly heel. Yeah, and then he got fucked over over his own stupidity. Now we're supposed to cheer him. Yeah, so not working for me. That is dumb. So I. I Hated the first half of the show more than you, but I really like the second half of Impact. To the back. Let's do Impact. You said this was a better show. This I've got to hear. All right. This show sucked, everybody. <laughs> this was a bad show. And again, anybody on the board who wants to tell me that this was a better show, you're wrong. If you want to tell me that you like this show better than Raw, fine. I can understand some people liking this show better than Raw. But don't come on here and tell me that this was a better show, because the facts say otherwise. It did a point six. This is a bad show. I mean, how can anyone argue that this is a good show? A good fucking show gets viewers. A good fucking show accomplishes something. More so than just, it made me happy for two hours. This was a bad show. It was badly booked. It did a bad job building up the pay-per-view. It did a bad job retaining viewers. What was good about this show? Well, what was not good was the opening, because I watched this, literally, I turned off Raw, I turned on Impact, so the last thing I had seen on Raw was the Shawn Michaels segment. The first thing I see on Impact is clips of Foley being fired and sad music playing as he walked out the door. You have never seen... (laughs) 
<laughs> you've never seen something done so well and the exact same idea done so, done so poorly back to back. And I howled with laughter. So Jarrett was in Hogan's office. Hulk was, I guess, trying to apologize for Eric. Jeff said he had nothing to apologize for. Hulk said he had great respect for Jarrett, and the fans loved him. So this is a new start for Jeff, and if he could beat AJ tonight, he'd be the top contender after lockdown. So Jeff left, and who should show up but Black Machismo, who it seems to me like he is, this is, if I, I could be wrong, but I think this is the first time he's been on TV since Hogan showed up. So they got along great, actually. And then uh, Hulk started doing his own Macho Man impression, and Hulk Hogan's Macho Man impression blew Jay Lethal's out of the water. But they shook hands. Hulk announced he was leaving, and he was putting Jay Lethal in charge along with Eric Bischoff. Another thing. Dave did note that Hulk Hogan was smart because he left his show in the opening segment knowing that this show was going to do a poor rating opposite the Raw after WrestleMania. But anybody who calls Hulk Hogan the smartest man in the business, you're wrong. Because if Hulk Hogan was the smartest guy in this business, he never would have gotten involved with his bumblefuck of a promotion. <laughs> bumblefuck needs to be used more often. The band come out. They had Bubba the Love Sponge with him. He was the biggest heel on the show. So except for the four guys in Bubba Army shirts in the crowd, everyone else hates him. He cut a promo on the marks using that word. He said he didn't need this job. But if he was, he had a, you know the radio gig. But if he was going to work there, he was going to hang out with guys like the band. He gave Nash a chance to address Eric Young, and uh, Nash called out Eric because he wanted to apologize to him. Eric came out. Nash said they were friends, and what he had done was for business. It was not personal. He had done what he had had to do to get the band contracts with TNA. He offered Eric a chance to join them, but it would mean the main event was off because Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy were not in their league. So he turned down this offer. He punched them. They swarmed him four-on-one with Bubba. Uh, RVD and Jeff ran out to make the save. Jeff said they can do it right now, but they're not going to. He said they're going to do it, going to do it in the main event inside a steel cage, stealing the thunder from their own pay-per-view in two or three weeks, whatever it is. And then an amazing thing happened. They played his song, and he began to sing the lyrics over the microphone. And if I was the prosecutor in his upcoming drug charges trial, I would use this clip as evidence. This man clearly abuses drugs. We had... The best new Burger King commercial of all time, where he breaks into McDonald's headquarters. He had Doug Williams and Brian Kendrick versus Kazarian and Shannon Moore. Kendrick was suplexed onto his head, sold it like death, and I believe the crowd chanted neck displacement. And then Shannon Moore hit him with a neck breaker and pinned him. A short match, from what lasted. Doug bailed. Shannon painted Kendrick with lipstick or something. And Doug had no time for the silliness, so... I guess Doug didn't pin him in the pay per view. Got be cute. He has right here with a brick and pinned him, but the feud must continue. Can I just ask one question? Sure. I don't want to get into this big argument again, but let me just ask one question. Yeah. Jesse Neal. I was mad at that too. But I mean, when when Jesse Neal, when when he's portrayed as a heel on TV, mm-hmm. the fans should not be allowed to boo him. He's. That's just a question. I, I'm not trying to start an argument. I just want to know what the difference is. He's not part in, of the show. He's not in uniform. He's, he's at that point. He's just another wrestler. He's not carrying the flag. He's not displaying the uniform of the of the armed forces. It's entirely possible. But just to make it clear, I just want to make it clear. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start an argument. If if Jesse Neal, if his wrestling character worked in fatigues, and was a heel, you would be very upset if the fans booed him. Well, there was once a guy named Sergeant Craig Pittman who did that exact thing. That never bothered me. Or Sergeant Slaughter. He, I was going to say he was Iraqi at the time, but then the first part was All correct. I'm saying is if if the fans were booing the soldiers, if they were actually booing the soldiers like, we don't like your performance here, or we think that you people suck, that would upset me. But I just don't, I just don't quite understand them playing the entrance music of essentially a heel. And and it being bad to boo them. Well, they had not. In minor detail, they had not started his interest music yet. I, I mean, everyone I, I, knew John Cena was about to come out. So. I didn't even think for like one second. How dare these people boo these troops? Well, I did, and and it's entirely possible that makes me an asshole. I don't know. I'm. Ju- I was just looking at different. Maybe to look at it through the eyes of an asshole. Let's move on. All right. 
Eric Bischoff called in Miss Tessmacher, who they apparently hired Brooke from ECW, and of course they put her in a dress. Now, it's a tight dress. She looked good, but I did not know. I thought this was just some new girl until I found out later what her old job had been. So, way to go, TNA. He uh, told her to ban Jay Lethal from his office. She failed. Lethal came in. He offered to make Eric Bischoff the third member of the Mega Powers. Eric said, that sounds awesome. Lethal booked a bunch of 80s guys. Eric told him to book a main event. There you go. Pope came out, and he cut the best promo of all time. So great that this segment did a point five. A point five, everyone. It did a, it did a four in my heart. But just the fact that a segment on Impact did a point five. Mind-boggling. Oh, that's no good. So, no one watched this great promo then. But he talked about AJ Styles and Ric Flair and astronauts and titles and pimps. I won't even bother trying to quote any of it. It was just amazing. So, uh, Chelsea came out. This is when you should have been happy this did a point five. Because no one was watching? This segment fell off a cliff. Mm. Chelsea. Chelsea came out. I mentioned this yesterday, but Chelsea was in... Three segments on this show. It's not like Kelly Kelly or... That's actually probably a bad example. Let's just put it this way. It's not like this is a girl that's overflowing with talent. Okay? She's good looking. Don't get me wrong. But is she the most good looking girl on this show? No. Brooke's got a better ass. Brooke just may be in every single conceivable way superior. She's a a girl that I would guess if you put her in a lineup with a bunch of other brunettes, you'd never be able to pick her out. I guarantee you I could not. So she's a generic-looking girl that cannot speak to save her life. As much as I bury Tiffany, I would so much rather listen to Tiffany talk than this girl. Because at least with Tiffany, I can laugh uproariously and I can mock her. And I could do a Tiffany impersonation, and we all have a great laugh. This girl's promo that she cut. First off, she was scripted to ask the Pope if that was a gun in his pocket or if he was just happy to see her. She really said this. Yeah. She really said this. She said she wanted to be a hoe in the single most unbelievable line I've ever heard someone utter on a pro wrestling show. What does this woman bring to the table? Three different segments. And if that's not bad enough, apparently they taped all of this out of order. So they had a segment in the middle. She had the segment where the Pope, I guess, made a fool out of her. And then she had a segment where she'd come back later and she was really mad at the Pope. Well, in the middle of that, she has a segment where she's wheeling Ric Flair out and yet never have known she was on this show in any other role. She wasn't mad. She wasn't happy. She was just there pushing a wheelchair. It was like she was a different character on the show. These are just things that, like, this sort of shit would never happen in a promotion that had a clue. They'd never put a mic in front of this girl's face. She'd never be in three different segments. They'd never tape it out of order so that she's in a segment, three segments, ten minutes apart, acting completely differently than she was in prior segments. This just pissed me off. Thank God nobody watched this. When she asked if, she had a, if he had a gun in his pocket, I was hoping he'd actually pull out a gun. But he did not. Uh, he flirted with her for a while until Desmond came in to sneak attack him, but he knew, De- he knew Desmond was coming, so he laid him out, kissed Chelsea, stuck money down her blouse, and left, and that was that. And then something truly amazing happened. Samoa Joe appeared on television. Yeah. He's alive. He was talked about coming back and being different. The last time he came back different, he was super fat, he was wearing pajama pants, and he had a penis drawn in his face. So I don't want different Joe. I want Joe go, to go back to being the same. But I probably won't, probably won't get it. Orlando Jordan came out. You're forgetting after the Joe thing aired, they cut back to Taz, who, of course, is Joe's real good friend, who was Joe's mentor for a period, who was the only person that cared that Samoa Joe was missing. They cut back to Taz... And he almost nonchalantly says, well, Joe's been found. (laughs) Wonder who he's talking about. And Mike Snay says, and I quote, I don't know. 
But let's talk about what else is coming up on this show here tonight. Yes. I'm I'm numb to them not caring that Joe was ever kidnapped and being hardly indifferent to the fact that he has now apparently been found. So Orlando Jordan came out in yellow tape. He came down from the ceiling. He cavorted for a while. He went over to his lounge where there was a very pretty man and a very pretty woman. He had makeup on, and that was it. He he did his he did his entrance, and that was the end. Yeah, they're leading up to something. Wow. So they said, I, I do just love the idea. In, 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 in 2010, we're all supposed to be intrigued by a bisexual character. And I think there's going to be two reactions. People are going to completely hate it and immediately turn it off, or people are going to just not be impressed. No, there's going to be one reaction. People aren't going to care. Yeah. I can't imagine a single person turning this off. You want to know why? Because they already shot something with, with Orlando Jordan that was edgy. He he kissed a man. He kissed a man. And I, I, I was told, uh, someone who was the, right there insisted to me. He says, I don't care what anybody says, he kissed the man. Well, Spike took one look at this, and no way this is fucking airing. So, with that being said, nothing all that edgy is going to air. Mm. They wouldn't even allow him to kiss a man. So, who could possibly care? Well, I don't know. It's going to be standards and practices all over again. Oh, great. When TNA gets pulled off the air, Eric Bischoff is going to say it's because they wouldn't allow Orlando Jordan to kiss a dude on TV. So we had Tara cutting a promo backstage. She said Daphne had taken something of hers, that being the spider. She said people called Daphne crazy and dangerous. They didn't know about crazy and dangerous. She said it was first blood, and that was okay with her. And Daphne said me too, and she attacked. They brawled throughout backstage, and... uh, Dave rolled over by the announce desk and down the stairs into the ring. And Daphne grabbed a toolbox, but Tara took it away from her and hit her in the head. And Daphne had the smallest little red dot on her head. It looked fake. A zip may have popped. I hope it was fake, honestly. And uh, it could have been much worse. I just love that they plugged two matches for this show last week. They plugged the main event, and they plugged Daphne versus Tara in a first blood match. So, number one, they actually thought that people were going to want to see Tara and Daphne in a first blood match. And then, when they finally delivered, she barely bled. Yeah. <laughs> what in God's name was the point of this? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Fortunately, we then got Jeff Jarrett versus AJ Styles. I love this match. This was a great match. This was a great match. Didn't save the show, but it was a great match. He... Finish was, uh, there was a ref bump, Eric came out, he did do the thing where he's, you know, this happens in TNA a lot, where the heel is standing behind the baby face of the weapon and holds it over his head, but just won't swing, and then the baby face turns around and suddenly the heel is caught off guard, so anyway, they did that, and Jeff got the guitar, he was ready to swing, but then AJ nutshotted him, in the process, his hand hit the guitar and sliced open, I bet that sucked. And he hit the Styles Clash and won. This this segment was a win. I did I did have one criticism in the sense that so the ref takes a bump and Jared is going to have the win behind the referee's back. Why can't he just hit the stroke? Why did he have to take him all the way up to the middle rope and hit a gigantic middle rope it's, stroke? It is stroke. What off the was the rope? point of what was the giant move needed for? I don't know. You couldn't just hit a move. I don't know. Especially when AJ was like back up ten seconds later. So really, Jared just killed his own hold. Happens all the time. I'm not saying that's good. I'm saying it happens all the time. We had a promo with uh, Hardy and RVD and Eric Young, and boy, did Eric Young come off lane next to these two. Well, I thought that same thing until I actually listened to all three men cut a promo, and Eric was the only lucid one of the group. I didn't say he was he was the most lucid, but the he other looked guys, like a complete goof next to these two. He looked like a goof next to them, and he and he sounded and he, he was lucid, but he was also monotone. And uh, drab, whereas Rob and RVD, or RVD and Hardy, were crazy to the point where Rob cut his promo, and then he literally tagged Jeff in, and Jeff cut his own promo. So, long story, he talked about climbing a ladder to the pay-per-view main event so the band would have their boots in his head, and Eric then finally said that he was the one who traded up, not Nash. So, that was wacky. Uh, he traded up? Yeah, because... How gay. <laughs> All right. We had uh, 
Machismo wanted to book Beefcake and Martel in the main event. It would have been an improvement. True. In 2010, uh, Eric said he wanted Lethal in the main event, so he sent him to the ring right now. And Lethal went because he's stupid. I actually think that if you put Rick Martel and Brutus Beefcake in the place of Scott Hall and Kevin Nash in that main event with Sean Waltman, it would have been a significantly better match. I almost Actually, could, I, I could I almost guarantee, guarantee that. Yes. For sure, Martell. I'm positive about Martell. Martell would definitely be better than Hall, and Beefcake would probably be better than Nash. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. So, anyway, we had Jay Lethal versus Beer Money. They uh, beat him up 2 on one for a while, and then when Storm's back was turned, Lethal hit a small package and won. A fun little handicap match. He stole James Storm's beer. That was that. They uh, talked about Hernandez after the injury angle last week. They you mean Sean. They were calling him Sean. I'll be honest, I was not paying a lot of attention to this. They had talked about his herniated discs and cervical damage to his neck. They said he could be out for several months, may not be back at all. And uh, they said he would address the crowd next week. We had Desmond Wolf versus Pope in their best of 400,000 series. They had a good match, and then Pope hit him with a chain and pinned him. Desmond. The Desmond Wolf, the guy who's getting the title shot at the next pay per view. Pin Pope. Pin by uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is this was stupid. Enjoy the match. Really, really stupid finish. The exact words of Mike Tanay were That yeah. match just shut down the Pope's <laughs> momentum going into lockdown. It sure did. <laughs> I can't argue. So he said. That is what Mike Tanay said. The only thing would have been better if a Taz would have said that. Because Taz usually plays my role yes. on the program. This match. Chelsea back out again. Now she's mad. She wasn't mad ten minutes earlier. Now she's mad. And not only did Desmond pin the Pope, but why did he pin the Pope? Because Chelsea started to flirt with the Pope. And while he didn't fall for it, he stood there like a goddamn idiot long enough for Desmond to wrap a chain around his hand and punch the guy out. The Pope looked like a complete idiot in this segment. Indeed. Not to mention he lost and also going I, into lockdown. And I, I don't see it in my notes here, so I may have imagined this, but I could swear that somewhere in the end of the show they promised that these two would wrestle again next week. I don't think so. Me, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. We had an angle promo. They are wrestling next week. God again. <laughs> and why? I, I don't know why. They have a ladder match, and I was thinking these exact words... What are they? What is going to be hanging from the ceiling that they will have to get? The answer, and keep in mind this is after Kurt Angle explained that the cage match can be won only by escaping the cage. What will be on the top when you climb the ladder is a key to the cage. What in the fuck does that mean? Apparently it means only the guy who wins the ladder match can win the cage match. So, so basically they're going to go into a cage... The winner's going to have the key to get out, and the loser is going to have to beat him up and get the key to get out. And apparently that's such a huge advantage. That that's going to be a hell of a match. That it's worth having a ladder match for. Not to mention the ladder match is building to the cage match. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's building to a cage match where the goal is to get out of the cage. Yeah. I don't know. This sucks. It, is, it sucks. I don't even... The, the, the promo... I don't know. Ang- Angle came out and rambled for a while. and said some people have thought Anderson might be as good as Angle. Name one. Maybe one person who thought Mr. Anderson was as good at Kurt Angle. So he rambled for a bit. Anderson came out. Anderson could be a much better promo, but he had to explain these really stupid steps. See, everybody, everybody keeps talking about this great promo, but it was fine. But he took... I've joked before that it took them 20 minutes to say what I could have said in in 30 seconds. I have never seen a man drag on a promo like this guy did. He went on and on. And by the way, he's got his shirt which says, Pro Wrestling is Real. And on the back it says, People are Fake. Which, first off, that's the best fucking shirt that Ken Anderson could ever wear. Number two, they never showed the back of the shirt. So Ken Anderson is out there on TV wearing a black shirt that simply reads, Pro Wrestling is Real. What? (laughs) What are people supposed to think when they see this? So he comes out here, and uh, he does his promo, and he says that they were 50-50 in wins, and they were canceling each other out. True! He did say they were doing the same thing back and forth every week for months on end. 
He said Bischoff would sign him next week to a ladder match. Um, it was a ladder match set up a cage match. He explained the key stipulation. This is where he just went on and on and on. It took him forever to spit out that it was a ladder match with a key on top. And uh, finally, after he talked forever, he included that nice guys finish last, Kurt. Because Kurt's a nice guy, you see. It took him ten minutes to spit that out as well. Kurt's a great guy, but great guys finish last. Thank God I'm an asshole. And then he said asshole again, like it was his last name. Which, of course, they bleeped out. Which begs the question, what's with the profanity if it's bleeped out? Is it really edgy when you swear all the time, but they bleep it all out? I don't know. This drove me nuts. The main event of the show was a steel cage match with the band versus RVD and Eric Young and Jeff Hardy. The baby faces were out on the ramp, and they went charging in and x packed the door into Eric Young's face, like a geek. They brawled to the ramp. Pac kicked RVD right in the face. I bet that sucked. And then it was just, uh, they, they threw Jeff and RVD into the cage, and they locked the door behind them, so Eric was locked outside. The five guys in the ring brawled around for, I don't know, six, seven minutes or whatever. And then Eric Young climbed to the top of the cage, and RVD hit his dive, and Jeff hit his dive, and Eric hit a giant super elbow from the top of the cage, which looked like it scared the hell out of him, and they won. God bless Eric Young, but was that the shittiest maneuver off the history of a cage in the history of professional wrestling? They called it an elbow, but he just kind of fell off. I don't blame him at all. He 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 didn't even jump. He like squatted down as low as he could, and then sort of just kind of almost plunged to the ground. Yeah, like he wanted to get down as fast as humanly possible. Why do you have the guy doing this then? I don't know. The guy's obviously afraid of heights. He obviously doesn't want to do this move. It really didn't look all that good. The people cheered, but I don't know. I am nitpicking the show right now. I just hate this show. This is back to hating it. This is a bad, the show has come full circle. This is a bad television show. Can we please just just have a better one? Because, again, I do have to watch it. I am. I've gone full circle. All the joy I had at the beginning of the show is gone. I hate Impact again. Just give me a good fucking show. I think I had a good impression of the show just because of the Jarrett AJ match. Because nothing else on here, looking back, was... Actually, nothing was any good. And I'm going to say this again. You know... And the Pope, I like the Pope promo as well. The show did a point six three, but that's actually probably a good thing for TNA. Because if this show had done a point eight, then I would bet $100 that next week's show in the now more coveted 8 to 10 time slot. 8 to 10. That's the new golden carrot. 9 to 11. Bad idea. 8 to 10. Yeah. The new golden carrot. If this show had done a point eight, I would have bet $100 that next week's 8 to 10 rating would have been even lower. Because who is going to remember this show starts an hour early? I hope I do, honestly. <laughs> I mean, every time Raw builds up that the show's an hour earlier, how many times have I forgotten? I mean, it's I, one I, thing... I did last time. It's one thing to remember that, oh yeah, it's 8 to 10 this week. But when the day actually comes, I mean, who really remembers the day of that they got to remember to set their DVR an hour earlier? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No one's going to remember. This show is going to do that first hour... I don't know if it's going to be lower than a point six three. I don't think that's possible. I don't think the show could possibly be do do lower than a point six three. Of course, I never thought it could do lower than a a one, and then a point eight. So maybe next week it's going to get a point five, and uh, then Dixie could talk about the final four. If it does a point five, I did promise to do my little dance. You did. After after the first show, I, I, the first uh, I, I promise uh, people have been. People have remembered because someone made a post in my in my forum about how there was one quarter that did a point five and he thought this. Should That's qualify. true. I I but I, I'm in the entire show. If the entire show does a point five, I will do a little dance. Next week, that first hour, I don't think it's possible. I just don't think it's possible. But I will tell everybody if that show does a point five next week, I'm going to bust out my iPhone, which does in fact have video. Sure. I'm going to play a song here with Vinny having the headphones on, and I'm going to force that fucker to do a dance. And I will do it. And I'm going to put it on the website for everybody to download for free and put on on YouTube and all that. But unfortunately, I don't think there's much of a chance of doing a point five. So everybody, don't get your hopes up.